We welcome you to the middle of the week. What a week it's been. We've got a lot of college football coming up Saturday. We had plenty last week. Hello and welcome to Wednesday on the program. Plenty of guests. Your chance to call in in just a minute. Why not? Let's get to the headlines. Most likely unbeaten in 2018. You can't, you can't say Alabama. Okay, you can say Alabama. I guess Alabama is one of the most unlikely, huh? Well, we'll find out later. Oh, Clemson is ahead of Alabama. Who saw that coming? Dabo Sweeney, speak up. Alabama is next, tied with Georgia and Washington. That's not good news if you're an Auburn Tiger fan. You play Washington in the front first game, and I don't really know uh, the Pope must have voted because Notre Dame is number five on the list. Actually, he didn't vote. College kickoffs on their way out in college football. This is the new rule. We will talk about how we should replace what's quite often one of the most exciting plays in the game. Tom Fernelli will join us later on. He'll tell us what's up with that. Can't wait to hear. Meanwhile, two emerging Georgia families and two looming family histories, Bulldogs, front and center, Seth Emerson from the Athletic. Who isn't from the Athletic? Bram and I have just signed up. We'll start next week. And from the New York Times, my daily source of sports information. How do athletic brains, athletes' brains, control their movements? I've wondered that. We'll tell you in two and a half hours, there is a new book out. It has nothing to do with Trump, by the way. Welcome to Wednesday. A lot going on. Your phone calls right now, 855 242 Seven two eight five. Always get that question. Six thirty. How do I get in the show? Call now. Call Paul, and try to make sense of it all. Here's what we have today. Seth Emerson from the Athletic. Seems like the last time we talked to him, he had a different job. That epidemic is out there. Tom Fernelli. Zach Schobern from the New York Times. If you don't follow him on Twitter. I don't either because I don't know how to spell his name. And your phone calls at 855-242-7285. What, a, what, a, what an ending to the show we had last night. Uh, we'll talk to Danny Brams about that in a minute. He is in, he is in the booth. We had a debate between Larry and Matt from, from Gainesville, Georgia. That was after Larry failed to correctly spell the state Utah on five attempts. We'll fill you in all that a little bit later on. Your phone call is now at 855-242-PAUL, 855-242-7285. He is a uh, friend of ours, regular caller to the show. And Matt starts it off for us on this Wednesday. How are you doing today, Paul? Matt, we are doing great. What about you, bud? I'm doing actually pretty good today, Paul. It's actually a beautiful day outside, a little warm, but not too hot. Well, it's springtime. Yeah, that's true. I wanted to call and talk about the upcoming college football season in A&M, who I think is going to be much improved in the college football season and which team's going to be much improved as well to first get started. I think the team's going to be much improved is going to be Georgia, Alabama, and Auburn. I don't think Tennessee's going to be in that boat. I think they're going to be improved, but not as much as Georgia, South Carolina, and Auburn. I think we'll finish second in the West, South Carolina. I don't think they're going to win the East, but I really don't think they're honestly going to beat Georgia, but have a chance, like you said. And I think AM is going to be one of those teams that might surprise some people listen, this year. Listen, I, I, Georgia's an interesting school because they have the talent. We just saw the statistic there that they have a 17% chance of going undefeated, but. If you had to take one of the two, Matt, mm-hmm. Alabama or Georgia, that has the least likelihood of getting to Atlanta, would you go Georgia or Alabama? Georgia. 
And I think A&M might be one of those teams that's surprising people this year. Yeah. I heard because you say, they have eight starters. That, I heard you say that last year, Matt, and they didn't. Because that's because I was wrong, Paul, and we should have fired someone a lot sooner. Okay. To be totally honest with myself. That one. Glad to hear you coming coming around. Well, you show me the light, Paul. Put it that way. And Matt, uh, you you stick around here, and you will you will see more than the light. Appreciate the call. Let's uh, go to Danny next. Danny is is up next on this Wednesday afternoon. Hey, Danny. Hey, Paul. How are you? We are doing well. Thank you for asking. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to tell you one thing first that I appreciate the way you treat the young young callers that call into your show. I, I, I really appreciate that. And Thank the next you. thing, you know, and by the way, uh, we have a, an inordinate amount of young callers, and and I've I've done this quite a few years. I've never uh, had this many ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. 14 year olds calling in we think we think it's fantastic uh it's different uh talking to them than some of the uh older folks but uh, we really uh, we really enjoy it we we encourage it as well well I, I just wanted you to know that i really appreciate you taking the time to talk to them and and number two is matt from georgia uh I, he is a idiot, if, if you can excuse my phrase, but he is he does not know what he's talking hey, about. Danny, let me ask you this friend to friend. Don't take this the wrong way. Go ahead. Did you just discover that? No, okay. I've been watching this show forever, <laughs> and I've been I've called a couple of times talking about Matt from Georgia. Yeah. And he is a complete idiot. Yeah, I think you, I think the second description was better than the first. And I've always no wondered this. I, I think an idiot is just an idiot, a complete idiot. Well, ends the conversation. How can I? How can I go lower than that? Then, um, well, you you really you can't you can't do that by, on a family <laughs> show. So, but a complete idiot will will do fine. It will suffice. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Any 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 vetoes? Any objections to him being considered a? You agree? Yeah, I thought you would. Let's uh, let's talk next to uh, Colby in Little Rock. How are you, Colby? I'm doing good, Paul. How are you doing? We're doing great. Thank you. Awesome. Well, the first thing I want to say right right before I get to the question um, is you're great at what you do. Keep up the good work. You're knowledgeable as it pertains to college football. And I just hope that the ratings continue to increase for your show. Well, That's thank you very thing. much. We, uh, we're hopeful. Uh, uh, in this business, you're always hoping to be around the next week. Absolutely. I have a feeling you're not just going to be there next week, but many, many years. So anyway, thank you very much. Uh, here's, here, here's my question, and it's just real simple. Um, what are your expectations, or what do you think will take place for Arkansas football under the new, I guess, coaching headship of Chad Morris. I think he's, a, he's a, obviously a really exciting hire. Um, you know, maybe for some Arkansas fans, he was on that, you know, number four, number five, as it pertains to the potential coaching uh, list for head coach. But nevertheless, I mean, I think he's brought in a lot of charisma, and I just want your overall thoughts on Yeah, I, I agree. I think he's do. a pretty exciting hire. Um, I, I do think it, it is going to be – a difficult turnaround in terms of right. time. Now, what's 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 difficult? Uh, first year is going to be difficult. Uh, he doesn't have a lot of players. Right. He does have a schedule that's na- that you can navigate. Um, so I look at getting somewhere near five hundred as as a big plus. I, I don't think eight or nine wins, uh, and I know some fans believe that, but fans always believe that. I mean, to me, somewhere around five hundred would be a good start, and then. Right, he can implement his offense uh, even more effectively with the right talent, and that's the problem. Uh, you know it better than I do because you're there. But he right. didn't inherit a, a, a lot of skill positions that do what he does well. Right, right. Well, I agree, Paul. I mean, there's no disagreement on my part. And uh, again, I just appreciate you taking my call, and I wish you nothing but the best for uh, your future. And uh, yeah, go Hogs, Whoopie Suey.
Next, you're holding up the line, ma'am. What did you say? You're next in line for the water slide, ma'am. Feet forward and enjoy the ride. Okay, dearie, this does look fun. We all, you melted me. I melted. The Wicked Witch of the West on a water slide? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to Geico. See what you've done. Oh! Geico. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Uh, during the during the uh, television break, for those of you uh, on radio, we were talking about this new idea, this new thing starting next next February. Uh, the, Alabama is going to have what's called a Crimson Cruise. I think we could do better than that. Can you imagine uh, getting all the Feinbaum characters together on a cruise boat? And the first night's entertainment will be our next caller from Gainesville, Georgia. Oh, I would love to go on a cruise, Paul. I bet you've been on a cruise. I'm going to work on my punctuality today, Paul, because because you you've been really on my punk on my punctuality. So when I end a sentence, I'm going to say period, period. Well, all I said last night is it, it wasn't really a matter of being grammatically incorrect. It's just that you never stopped talking long enough to punctuate a sentence. That, that was my only point. Well, that, that's what I'm going to work on. Hi, yesterday was Radio Gold, wasn't it? I thought so, yeah. I mean, Larry, he's a hoot. I mean, he he truly is. That was a lot of fun squaring off of Larry. He, he, how, did you how, how did you, how did you feel it went? I don't know. I felt like, according to y'all, I mean, I must have got knocked out the first round. Yeah, Danny, was, Danny and John had you going down pretty quickly. I mean, I was laughing so hard. Um, it was just hilarious. Like, I don't, I don't know what. I don't, does Larry start drinking at like ten or twelve every yeah. day? I mean, he's but, hilarious. Larry, were, were you thrown off when he couldn't spell Utah? Is that what upset you or discomfort? No, yeah, it was you? pretty funny because you were trying to like walk him through it, and then you made the reference to the the dog track in Alabama, and he was like, "Oh, Utah." It was it was pretty funny. But and then the and then the comment about. I said, how do you spell moron and M-O-W? And that was a joke to the Alabama Foundation. I saw all these tweets last night. said, Matt can't spell moron. No, it was kind of a jab at Larry. It was sarcasm. It's M-O-R-O-N. That, that's what we may need to have, Paul. We need to have a fine bomb spelling bee. Me yeah, against I think Larry. that would be funny. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm not a good speller either. And, and quite frankly, nowadays with so many aids, uh you don't have to be a good speller. No, you're right. You're right. I mean, you have spell check on every yeah, device. And sometimes possible. it's not even right, but it, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I just like start when I'm looking up a word on my phone. I just like dialing up any number, any letter I can come up with, and hoping it pieces it together I, for me. I want. I wanted to comment on Matt from San Antonio. I, I don't. There's no doubt in my mind that Alabama's going to be good next year. I mean, let's be honest. Let's take all the bias out of it. Alabama's, a, you know, Saban's a great coach. You know, I know I pick on Saban to, to roll up the masses. I know sometimes people don't get the joke. But I do think, I do think, and I'm not saying Georgia, I'm not saying Georgia's better, but I do think Alabama has a tougher road to Atlanta because the West is a lot tougher than the East. The East has been down for a long time. I mean, uh, I just... You know, the West has got LSU, they've got Auburn, now they've got Jimbo at Texas a and I think Matt from San Antonio has put a little bit too much stock in that. I, it takes two years for a coach to really, you know, I mean, you looked at what Kirby did at Georgia, he walked in a great situation. It takes you two years to implement your system. I don't think Mullen's just going to go be instantaneously successful. I, I, he'll be successful, but it takes time to implement your program. Yeah, and I'll tell you something, Matt. Uh, I can't believe we're having a normal conversation. But uh, mistakes are made the first year, too. Mistakes that you won't make the second and third year, but you will lose a game on a mistake your first season often. Not I always, mean, but often. A lot of Georgia fans, Kirby's first year, were doubting him because they went 8-5, and five, lost to Tech, they lost to Vandy. But, I mean, Kirby was real blunt saying, we are – you know, everybody's – Kirby got a lot of good players, but we were so weak on the defensive line and the offensive line. We didn't have depth. 
And that's where Alabama is so good. I mean, Alabama truly, if you look at 2012, uh, they wear teams down. I mean, that's where well, that's the saving Saban mantra has got it. to uh, force yeah. you into submission. And that's where, I mean, because Alabama doesn't come out and beat teams 60 to nothing the first quarter. The, the games they have lost to, like, Ole Miss and uh, Johnny Mansell, those teams jumped up really quick and then tried to hold a lead and sustain Alabama from coming back. So, but um, are you going to A-Day? Or are y'all going to have crews at A-Day? Or y'all uh, going? I will not be there. I, mean, I actually uh, have something else to do uh, this week, and I'm not going to be able to make it to uh, – I'm actually going to be in Athens. Before. Are you? How far are you from Athens? Uh, 45 minutes. I'm going to G-Day. Okay, I'm actually going to be in Athens tomorrow. Well, you got it personal or is it business? Yeah, I'm, I'll actually be there tonight. I've got to go interview somebody there tomorrow. Cool, Secret. cool, cool, cool. Well, that, <laughs> yeah. hopefully, it's, it, hopefully, it's, you're not going to reveal some bad information. On no, no, this is actually a pretty positive thing. You'll love it when it happens. I got you. I got you. Well, yeah, it's 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 pretty right now. We're and, doing and, a uh, we're doing film. an hour long special um, on Daryl from Georgia. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> God, spare us all. I'm Thanks sorry. <laughs> no, I, I am. I am going to be there. Though. Squirrel is up next. Uh, hey, Squirrel. Hey, thank you for taking my call. Thank um, you. I'm, I don't know. I'm just not buying Matt's apology. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, Matt, Matt on the uh, you know whatever uh, sleep inducing drug that he took before he called, but I think I like him better the other way. Yeah, me too. I mean, he's just another boring caller. Yeah. Actually, it's and just another dog. Speaking of his call, his yeah. call yesterday with Larry. I mean, of all the phone feuds you've had over the years, I mean, if you ranked them, that has that would have to be probably the worst phone feud in caller history. And I'm, I'm serious when I say that. I mean, you've got to admit it was it was pretty pathetic. Well, and again, I mean, you got you got to take into consideration. Well, at five in the afternoon, Larry's already had what twenty twenty five beers, so he's not in his best and. Matt, you know, I mean, he's just not really quick. So, you know, it was just really, it was just like two two monkeys humping a football. It was just pathetic. But um, the, the last and, and hour, no way that, would it compare to some of the great ones that you've been a part of. No, 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 I don't know. I, did I mention me? No, I, I'm just saying. I mean, you've been you've been a part of some pretty. No, 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 Jim. All the epic ones have been involved in Jim, and I've just been in a few of those because. You know, I got drug in by him, but, but no, I, I did not mention anything about any of my phone feuds. And, um, and you were the one that mentioned the last hour of the show. And, and anyone who did not listen yesterday, I really encourage you to go back on the podcast. It was really an interesting show, an interesting hour. And I heard you dangling the um, the mythical iPad carrot in front of Millie during the, the last hour of the show yesterday. Um, and with the fact in mind that our surprise party for Jim didn't go well because we didn't have the blessing of the, of the Don, the kissing of the ring and all that. Um, what if some of us got together and somehow got Millie to Charlotte? What type of reception would she get at, at the studio? Well, I she appreciate expressed I, interest in coming. Squirrel, I appreciate you offering that, but, but I, I, I can't, you know, we have a, I think Millie is her condition would probably be better for her to stay where she is, okay. and let okay. us come Valid. to her. Valid. Okay, well, that's why. Hey, and, and, that's and I why say that I not not uh, squirrel. Not, not you've probably been to, to studios before. They're not that they're they're not that big. Sure, there's really no, not that no. much to do. It's not like uh, limited mobility. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and and I understand that. I understand that. And that that again, I have enough respect for you that. That I ask you before if she just shows up. Let's and besides, I've, I'm already uh, I'm already out of passes for visitors. I, you know, you only get like three a year. And oh, I understand. And I understand. I, 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 said, used mine up, I, used, I used mine up last week when 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 Larry and uh, Jim and I mean. And one last here. thing. And speaking of Jim, one last thing. Um, you know, I've never promoted my my Twitter site, but I put a tweet up today. Someone for some reason sends me various tweets. Uh, regarding Jim, and someone sent me a tweet of Jim's. It was a political tweet of Jim. Oh, really? Jim, Jim and, tweets yeah, about politics? I would have never from known. MS. I well, sent you a copy of it today, matter of fact. And, and in this political tweet, you know, he's promoting a book called The Masters of Deceit. And in this tweet, he's, he says that he did an extensive book report on this book. 
1959 during his junior year of high school. Did he really which say actually, that? <laughs> Paul, I'm not making this up, dude. Okay. I don't make things up. You know, he came on here last week and called me a, he called me Charles Manson. He said I was worse than Charles Manson. And while you didn't have my back, you did point out to him that Charles Manson actually killed nine No, I people. did. I thought so, I was a pretty, pretty... So I appreciate that. Because a lot of people may that. not have known who Charles Manson... <laughs> I think most is. people know who Charles Manson is. Well, I mean, you say that, uh, Squirrel, but I, I'm willing to bet there are a lot of people out there that have no earthly idea who... I mean... You, you, no, no, come on, I mean, he, I mean his, the murder... Charles. Well, I don't know. Even the millennials know who I am sub- I am shocked every day of, of, of things that people don't know. That happened in a different era. Nice deflection. But how do you address this allegation that he did a book report in 19? When did he send out that tweet, by the way? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. But somebody sent it to me. It's from Because I'm Jim going through Tuscaloosa his Twitter uh, feed, and, and I frankly don't see it. Okay. Well, like I said, I, if, if somebody wants to go to Squirrel from MS, uh, there's a copy of it that someone sent me. I was just asking, is this, is this little logo, is his address on it? It, it looks legit. I was just well, wondering. You got to remember, there, there, are, there are a lot of you know. I'm not. Def- I'm not being Jim's attorney here, but I am. Uh, there are a lot of well, fake. There are a lot of fake Jim accounts out there. This is the well, far as I know. This is not one of them. And, and again, I cannot. I was going to alert Jim, and I put on there that somebody hijacked Jim's account. Why don't you send uh, it to apparently. me again so I can see it? Because I, I, yeah, I don't. I, I know that this may sound may con- con- convict uh, me of not of not being a. Uh, a good Twitter follow, but anyway, I tell you what, I will ask him because he's on hold. Jim, uh, do you? Uh, I, I, this doesn't well, sound I just like wanna, it. you know. I'm not going to get into these cra- crazy things anymore with that fool. Uh, all he does is twist and and, and same thing. Rush Limbaugh did to somebody today, just lie, pure out did, lie. Did you? Uh, did you well, actually say you that? You're uh, you going to be like Matt? Just said, run over me or no. let me talk? Mm. Well, let me talk. I'll, you know, I'll tell you if you let me talk. Go. You know I'm going to talk. You don't need to ask me to talk. I can talk. Here's what happened and exactly what I did. I tweeted that my junior year in high school, I read Masters of the Seat. Here's the lie. Where he, here's, where the, here's the truth where that moron just now lied. I said, I tweeted, I mean, I read the book, which was written. It was written. That's what I said in the tweet in 1959 by J. Edgar Hoover. It's called well, Masters I actually have a copy of the tweet now. It says, written in 1959, my junior year of high school. And do you, did you notice he left out that word? He wants people, again, to think I'm 80 years old or whatever, which is a lie. That's all, that's all that fool is trying to do is belittle me, and that's all he's ever been about is just taking out of context everything I say. So 59, he's a liar. Was, 59 was not your junior year, right? No. Heck no, it wasn't even close. But I'm just saying, that's when the book was written, Paul. Okay. Go read the damn book, and you can see, well, written in 1959. Okay. I get so mad even thinking about that fool, uh, uh, which he is, to me, I didn't say he's a killer, but he's as bad a person. Well, you compare him to I'm Charles, saying. I mean, Charles Manson, again, for, for you. For Charles, you yeah. Paul, I know characters. You're talking about, he's a character. He's a rotten character. I'm talking about Squirrel, uh, you know, with a model wife, and he's a pervert, a perv. He's and he's a liar. How do you know he's and a I'm pervert? He, without, without having committed any crime, I don't know any crime he's committed except coming on here and lying about me. I still say he's as bad a person. That's what he is, in my opinion. Bad a person as that guy that we talked about a while well, ago. Jim, uh, for the record, Charles Manson, uh, that we know of, killed what he nine did, people. I and don't is considered care. I'm the telling most... you, Squirrel is rotten as hell. And all I want to do is clarify... He was wrong again. I just said, written, the book was written in 1959. You notice how he twisted that lie. You know you know what he's doing. You've done it too. You try to imply that I was a junior in 1959, which would make me, what, probably 80, which is a lie. It would. By the way, Charles Manson died, so let me make sure I, I get the tense yeah, correct. I don't, I for, well, I'm not. That, I forgot I'm that he a died point. a couple of months ago. I, oh, I'm, I'm paying hey. I'm making a point. I'm Jim, making a Jim point. I was defending you, by the way. Well, you didn't defend me. You never defend me. You you love that guy to come on here and just just lie. I'm just why well, I don't like the show anymore. Jim, I'm the, Jim, I'm the one who said it was probably a fake account. It, actually, yeah, it wasn't, well, it wasn't a fake, a fake account. account. It wasn't a fake account. It okay, was, I was my I was account. I was trying to help you, but since you... You don't, you're not going to help me by lying. 
Okay, thank you, Bob. Thanks for helping me so much. I I really appreciate all your help. I didn't know I was Jim. I didn't even know. I don't know that. How would I know I was lying if I didn't know what the truth was? Welcome back. Glad uh, everyone is here, and uh, certainly looking forward to uh, digging in on this next subject uh, by uh, by Seth Emerson, who has been with us many many times. He just uh, made a move to the Athletic. Uh, which is one of the fastest growing, if not the most fastest growing uh, sports website in America. And the headline of this article, two emerging Georgia Bulldogs and two looming family histories. Uh, one, Elijah Holyfield, and the other involves a uh, young man named Rice who is a, deals with a terrible tragedy. Seth, first of all, thanks for being with us and glad yep. you're here. Uh, congratulations. This, uh, when did you make the move to the uh, Athletic? Uh, officially, my first day was Monday. And I've just been kind of quiet about it till they made their big announcement today. Um, and the first call I made where I said, hello, this is Seth Emerson at The Athletic, was to Vince Dooley. So I didn't intentionally do it that way, but it, I thought that was that was a pretty good way to start. I like that. Um, yeah. And I'm sure Herschel Walker will be the next on your list. Um, glad you're here, uh, and congratulations. Uh, it is a f- fabulous site for those who have not been to it yet. Let's let's talk about this story. I, I think I did a pretty poor job of trying to explain uh, two young players, uh, one with a famous father, one with a tragedy in his past. You did the story. I'll let you pick it up from there. Well, Georgia just happened to make – those two guys available last night so i kind of scrambled for a way of you know how can i write about both of them and so i kind of developed that narrative myself and obviously elijah holyfield everyone knows who his father is and he's been kind of you know in his shadow he doesn't run from it he you know he embraces it but doesn't like you know carry it around with him all the time he was actually raised principally by his mother Um, and make sure that everyone knows that that was, you know, the big part of his story as well. He's a guy who a lot of Georgia fans have had interest in him because he's a tailback. And uh, I think the the Georgia second or third string tailback is always like one of the more popular people on the team at Georgia, much like the backup quarterback is the most popular player for everyone else. Um, And and this might be Elijah's time to shine. I I think you might hear a lot of, about Elijah coming out of uh, G-Day on Saturday because DeAndre Swift, who would normally be their starting tailback, is not going to play. I'm I'm anticipating he's going to be out, Um, but he'll be back for the season. So anyway, it'll be interesting for Elijah. Monty Rice, not a lot of people know his story. His cousin um, was was killed, uh, shot by police. Uh, last September. Um, I would encourage people to read up on it. It would be hard for me to synthesize it down, you know, in a, in a 30 seconds or so. And it was, it was something that was met with controversy. And, you know, Monty has kind of held that out as something that, that he wants to be talked about or have talked about. And as he told me last night, he doesn't want his cousin to just be forgotten. So it's a reminder, Paul, that all these guys have a personal story and, you know, that's what I got in this business to do is tell personal stories. And um, I, I'm thinking that at The Athletic, I'll, I'll have even more time to hopefully delve into things like that. You know, it's interesting. So I went to a symposium not long ago uh, where I work and they said we're a storytelling company. And, uh, you know, you forget that sometimes we're so used to just uh, who's going to win, what's the record going to be. And you forget that the stories really make it so so much more compelling. Well, speaking of stories. Uh, Georgia has one of the best in college football. We just saw a stat that gives them uh, about the third best or the second best chance of going undefeated. Uh, Alabama tied with them behind Clemson. Uh, I know, I know some dog fans are, are could not be more optimistic, but are, are are there any who are like going maybe maybe this train has gotten a little bit ahead of schedule considering who is going to be drafted. Uh, in uh, eight days uh, at the NFL draft, and, and in terms of transition, it may not be as easy as predicted. What do you think? Yeah, that's a good point. Whereas after the 2017 draft, last year's draft, when only one Georgia player was picked, Isaiah McKenzie, and I believe he was picked in the fifth round, and the reaction to that was, "Wow, Georgia, you know, you know, Mark Rick didn't leave Kirby Smart with that much talent." And I kind of pushed back on that, as did other people, and said, "No, no, no there's talent. It's just." Wait till next year's draft. 
And that's what I think you're going to hear next week when Roquan Smith goes in the first round. Lorenzo Carter, Isaiah Wynn have chances to sneak into the first round. Sonny Michelle, Nick Chubb, where they get picked. Sonny Michelle might go first round. Um, I think it's going to hit home for a lot of people how much talent Georgia does lose off last year's pretty special team. Now, having said that, Kirby Smart and his staff have been recruiting really well. So it's a matter of how quickly that talent can come together. When you look at the schedule, Paul, in September, two games that are going to be really interesting. At South Carolina Week 2, at Missouri Week 4, I think most people would agree Georgia on paper is better than those teams. But both of those teams have returning veteran quarterbacks who can throw the ball. Georgia's going to have a lot of starters on defense to replace, potentially a very young secondary. That makes for an interesting matchup on the road. If Georgia Georgia can get through September unscathed, still got to go to LSU and Baton Rouge. You still got Missouri, or you still got Auburn coming in in November. Uh, you know, you go, you have the cocktail party against Florida in late October. Georgia should be on paper better, but how good does Dan Mullen have Florida going? So there's a lot of stumbling blocks potentially for Georgia, but you do look at all 12 games on their schedule and say if that game were being played week one, Georgia would be favored. So the schedule could kind of go both ways. But you know, Seth, I, when I, I look at the yeah. schedule, uh, I see exactly what you're saying, and having Auburn at home really helps, Tech at home. But it, it's a sneaky schedule at South Carolina, at Missouri, at LSU, right. at, at Kentucky. Those are not teams that you should be concerned about, but they're all middle to uh, middle of the pack, uh, a couple of them, and South Carolina probably upper echelon of the pack. Exactly. And when you're a Georgia team that's going to be – as inexperienced as it's going to be relative to last year, that makes a lot of those sneaky games against kind of middle of the pack, upper middle pack teams so dangerous, which is why I think I would, I mean, I I still wouldn't be shocked if Georgia went 11 and one or 12 and two, but I I still would tend to, you know, if you put a gun to my head, say, I, I might go 10 and two. I don't know which two they'll be, but, I just I think there's a there's a chance of of Georgia losing two games there that we don't quite expect. Like you know, there's always a, the team Paul that that is much better than people thought. Like Georgia last year. Um, yeah, I mean, what if LSU makes a big jump this year? Then that game for Georgia at LSU is really tough. Uh, like I said, what if Dan Mullen really has Florida going by the time Georgia goes with cocktail party? And like I said, those two matchups with teams that go- should be good passing teams in the first month against the young Georgia secondary, you know, I also put in that category. Let's talk about the quarterback situation. A, a year ago, it was, it was a competition. This year, people are looking past, but maybe not. Uh, I mean, certainly Jake Fromm has earned his stripes. Uh, but uh, what are you sensing and, and what are you seeing? Well, I, I see in Justin Fields a guy who, I mean, we see limited portions of practice. We'll all see everything this Saturday. Justin Fields, he looks the part. Um, he and Jake Fromm are actually pretty similar in, in height. Um, I, I've heard from some people that you know Jake Fromm is still the guy when it comes to passing the ball. He's, he's more accurate. He's the guy that you know we saw last year for Georgia. But Justin Fields has some moments. He has some real flashes during practice, especially when he's able to you know freelance and, and run the ball. Um, I, I've always said that as good as Justin Fields is even if he's as good as advertised, Jake Fromm is not going to be the kind of kid who's just going to rest on his laurels last year and think that he's going to you know, still be the starter because of what he did last year. It's just not his, his personality. He's kind of got that Aaron Murray thing to him where he's always going to be in the film room. He's always going to be studying. So I, I think it's going to be really hard to displace Jake Fromm. I'll be really interested to see how Justin Fields does on Saturday and how much he kind of continues to push for on forward. So much was made uh, the the other day uh, about Trevor Lawrence, and we had a call from a, a Georgia fan who, who was unhappy with uh, Lawrence ending up at Clemson. Uh, you mentioned Fields. I mean, I realize this is water under the bridge, but can you take us back to that and, and how everything sorted out? Yeah, Lawrence was the – was the target uh he was I, I think kirby may have even visited him the first day of of one of the recruiting periods even after he was still committed 
to Clemson, but not signed. Um, and then they didn't get Trevor Lawrence. I mean, it was pretty much a Georgia Clemson battle. Um, Lawrence commits to Clemson and Georgia pretty quickly kind of behind the scenes, but turns its attention to, you know, they were going to sign another quarterback no matter what. And they turn their attention to, to Justin Fields, even though he was committed to Penn state and Fields was an in-state kid, just like Trevor Lawrence. And, and he backed off the commitment to Penn state. And at that point, everyone kind of knew that, that Georgia had really entered the picture and, and they got that commitment and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Uh, it, it's probably something we're not going to know for another two, three, four years as to whether, you know, maybe it was a blessing for Georgia to miss out on Trevor Lawrence and get Justin Fields. Maybe it's the reverse, but I think this is a case where Georgia did try to get both. They, I, I don't think there was much of a lack of trying to get Tre- Trevor Lawrence. Great stuff, Seth. Thanks. Congratulations again on The Athletic. Uh, we will talk to you very soon. Thanks, Paul. Anytime. Great stuff. Seth Emerson joining us. And we're up against a break. More of your phone calls when we come back. We welcome you all of you to our number two. Glad you're here. Good first hour. A lot of talk about the dog, Seth Emerson, saying Georgia could lose two games. That sounds like a big deal, uh, considering that program a year ago would have probably taken two losses coming off of a five-loss season. Suddenly it seems, are you kidding? We'll talk more with you at 855-242-7285. Terry is in Georgia. You're on the air. Go right ahead, Terry. Hey, Paul, uh, I thank you for taking my phone call. Uh, I know you attorney. Uh, and I always believe a person's innocent until proven guilty and served jail time. Do you agree or not? Well, sure. I mean, listen, uh, our, our system sets up for the presumption of innocence. Uh, that's what we're supposed to, or how the court is supposed to view anyone. So uh, even though most don't do that, don't, don't do it. Most people make up their mind uh, based on their own facts, not the actual facts. You are correct. Well, I, you know, I have trouble with the baseball players getting accused of doing all this stuff and pointing fingers saying they didn't do it, but they did. But they ain't, they didn't do no jail time. I mean, you know, or nothing like that. I mean, to me, you got to go to jail to be guilty. Well, uh, I mean, you can be convicted uh, of a crime and not sentenced to jail. But, uh, yeah, I mean, technically or theoretically, you are correct. Well, that's what uh, he you know what phrases. I mean? He well, phrases one of the ones. I don't understand. He got paid fifteen million dollars, and well, let's talk about Hugh Freeze for a second. Uh, Hugh Freeze was the head coach at, at, at Ole Miss. They were hit with uh, major, 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 major. They were accused and found guilty of major violations by the NCAA. That case is still on appeal, so it hasn't. We don't have a final disposition. He, uh, the, the, ver- the verdict in that case, of course, it was an NCAA case, uh, came in after he was let go. He was not let go for anything he did in relation to the NCAA. He was let go for personal indiscretions. 
So, I mean, there, you know, we have, we have mitigating circumstances here with Hugh Freeze. What, what are your thoughts on Hugh Freeze? My thoughts on Hugh Freeze is that he did not serve no jail time. Well, ho- hold on a second, uh, Terry. Let me explain something to you. I don't mean to sound like this is a law class, which it's not. But Hugh Freeze has not been accused of any criminal activity. Uh, Hugh, Cree- Hugh, Hugh Freeze was was charged by the NCAA, which is a private institution. Um, so, I mean, that case never got to court. Uh, it was a, it was a separate issue. The NCAA has its own bylaws, and they have a committee uh, which dict which which hears uh, hears hears cases in which someone, or in this case, a school is accused of breaking uh, breaking rules. But, uh, no, he was never in danger of going to, going to jail. What about the kids from North Carolina that didn't do anything? I mean, they said they didn't do nothing wrong. I, I'm, I'm trying to remember which kid that was. Oh, uh, you know, the school got accused of... Uh, Doing papers for them and oh. doing well, all kinds of yeah, stuff. Yeah, I mean, but, but Terry, remember something. Um, being accused of, of wrongdoing by the NCAA and being accused of wrongdoing by uh, a court, a uh, federal court or a judicial court or, or state court are totally different things. Uh, so, I mean, there are penalties. I mean, you can be, uh, I mean, in, in Ole Miss's case, they were prohibited from uh, going to a bowl game, but uh, no, one, no one's in. No one's in Serious trouble of serving jail time in the, in either case. Uh, do you understand better? Yes, sir. And okay. I appreciate your help in understanding this. Thank Good. you so much. Good to hear from and you. And you're a very helpful man. And very, I love you so. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think there are a lot of people in college athletics who are breathing a sigh of relief right now that they don't go to jail for breaking NCAA violations. Uh, otherwise, we might have we might have to get some new jails. Hambone is up next. Mr. Feinbaum, how you doing? Doing great. You know, I got a comment on Hugh Freeze. He should never be able to coach in college football again. You got the University of Mississippi that's suffering the consequences of one individual in this case until the NCAA stops this action and it makes them take responsibility instead of the university. It will continue. You, to you know, you know the thing about that case and every NCAA case that is disturbing to a lot of people and. It's hard to understand, but these cases are, are much more about how good your lawyers are than what you really did. But the, the idea that someone like Hugh Freeze, who was in charge of the program, but acted like he never did anything, he made a couple of mistakes. That's all he ever did. The, the idea that he would be suspended by, for only two games by the NCAA and that the school never apparently considered firing him over that, uh, just goes to show you how when universities get in trouble, they, they're all in. Uh, they, they 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 get they get together in a circle, and they hold each other's hands. Uh, that way, uh, nothing rubs off on anyone else. So, but uh, it, it's it's it, the idea that that he didn't lose his job over those allegations is pretty amazing. Wipe out a program right down the road and got another another good job waiting on him. Uh, not well, right. yeah, I mean, ba- basically, basically, what Hugh Freeze has to do is just uh, get out of everybody's, get off everyone's lawn for a year, and then next year he'll come back, and they'll have this, sto- you know, they'll have the story chiseled down to he made a couple of mistakes, should have pay- been paying attention more, uh, as far as his personal disc- indiscretions, made a mistake there. He and his wife have gone to a few churches, and all all is good. I ho- also, I heard you say that Charlie Manson killed nine people. Do you know, Paul, Charlie Manson actually never killed anyone. The family killed for Charlie. Well, you, uh, you are correct about that. I mean, he, he, uh, he ended up going to jail for, uh, for se- I think, for seven of the, for the, se- the, the, uh, the, the family. I, mean, I think the family killed seven people that night. In California, I, I, I do believe that he was uh, accused or convicted of killing two other people somewhere else, uh, but I could be wrong. But you're, right, so you are you are day. correct. The actual uh, the Manson family was the one who uh, he, he he ordered them to kill, but he still uh, he still went to went to jail for life. Uh, same thing. Or, sort of like O.J. Simpson found guilty of civil, but not a. That's, that's well, no. When you when you when you uh, when you have a family uh, a cult, 
and they are under <laughs> your spell, and you go with them and order them to kill uh, seven people, you're going to go to jail. All right, Paul. Have a good day here. Thank you. I, I mean, it's pretty much the same thing, although you're technically correct. But I, th- I think, I, again, Charles Manson died a couple of months ago, and this case is about 50 years old. But I'm pretty sure uh, he, uh, he bit the bullet on two other murders unrelated to Sharon Tate and that family. Hey, thanks for the call. Not that anyone, anyone really wants to relitigate that, uh, that story in 2018. Trey is up next. Uh, good afternoon, Trey. Hey, Mr. Feinbaum, how are you today? We are great. Thank you for calling. i uh, like too blessed to be stressed, I guess, huh? You better believe it. <laughs> I have two questions for you. What in the world is going on with Reuben Foster? Have you heard anything lately? Well, yeah, right now uh, he is uh, he is not uh, part of the – I mean, he's been uh, – I don't know what the technical phrase is, whether he's just been uh, – you know, temporarily uh, disallowed to participate. But, yeah, I, I can't I, – I have a hard time believing he's going to play again. I do, too. Isn't he the one that they sent home from the combine? Yeah, you better Didn't believe he? it. Man, and, and you know what? I remember interviewing Ruben uh, a couple of months later uh, on this show, and he blew it off like it was a big misunderstanding. I remember that. I sure do remember him on the show and you, you talking to him yeah. about it. My second question to you is this. This is a question for you and the listeners. Um, the NFL draft, man, I am so tired of turning my TV on ESPN and McShay and Mel Kuyper talking about the NFL draft. I love the NFL draft, but they have just, they made the NFL draft actually not interesting. Cause it, I, mean, I mean, they talked about it for the past five or six weeks. How much can you talk about the NFL draft, Paul? Well, you know, the NFL draft has become uh, a cottage industry in and of itself, and and it goes on to all, uh, as soon as the Super Bowl is over. But once basketball ends, it becomes the the biggest topic outside of the NBA playoffs. And you're you're right. I mean, it's uh, there's too many mock drafts out there. They change. Well, it I mean, Kuiper Kuiper does a mock draft a year out, and uh, I mean, it changes. And we talked to Mel the other day, but all you can do is a projection. That's it. It changes every two or three hours. I think we'll have stuff going across the screen. Well, let problem. me tell you, Trey. If you, if you think it's bad today. <laughs> Just wait till next week. Yes, sir. Thank you for taking my call, and y'all have a great day. Remember, we're all too blessed to be stressed, Paul. Thank, Thank you very you. much. I, I totally agree. We'll take a break. Next, you're holding up the line, ma'am. What did you say? You're next in line for the water slide, ma'am. Feet forward and enjoy the ride. Okay, dearie. This does look fun. We all, you melted me. I've melted. The Wicked Witch of the West on a water slide? Surprising. What's not surprising? How much you could save by switching to GEICO. See what you've done! GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. Welcome back. We're all glad you're here. Fat Back is also back. Uh, Good afternoon. Hey, Paul. You had a pretty good week. Yes, it's been great. Thank you for asking. I've been out of the country this week playing golf, and I get back into Alabama today, and the first thing I hear is Jim from T-Town, Mr. Magoo, bitching about somebody else. You know, I'm too I'm too blessed to be stressed, and now I'm all stressed out here in Jim. I mean, what is wrong with that man, Paul? Uh, I don't know, Fabak. Uh, you tell me. Uh, by the way, where'd you play golf? Florida. I thought you said you were out of the country. I was. Florida is out of the country. You been down there lately? <laughs> I have, yes. I, 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 I catch your drift. I mean, you know, I, I know I blah Spanish, Dutch, German, or Spanish. So you know, I, I when, by the way, when I lived in Alabama, when I left the state, I, I felt like I was out of the country too. I mean, brother, it's 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 just a different world down there, but. I'm glad y'all had a good week. I just wish Jim would get him some Ritalin and some Geritol and just chill out before he has a heart attack. Yeah, by the way, uh, the, pres- the prescribing is for the other person in my house, but but I think Ritalin uh, is probably a little tame for Jim's problem. <laughs> I hear you, brother. <laughs> well, hey, man, I, I just wanted to holler at y'all. Y'all have a good week. I'm glad to be back in Alabama. Thank you. We, we're glad you're back, too. Uh, thanks for the call. Steve is in Knoxville. How are you, Steve? Hey. I'm good. How are you, Paul? We are doing great. Thank you for calling. You look like you've got a haircut. Did you get your haircut? 
I did. Uh, I got tired of people telling me my hair. Was, by the way, I mean, when somebody tells me my hair is too long, that's like a compliment. But uh, uh, I decided to end the speculation that uh, I was going to grow it down as long as I man's hair. You could put it in a ponytail like the rest of these idiots down here. In the yes, you know, I saw a guy on TV today. It wasn't, it wasn't a ponytail. It was all kind of bunched in the back. What do you call that? A bun? Yeah, I like I, I Now, I tell you what. The guy was pretty uh, I really, if I could do a man bun, I, I would. That would be cool. But after well, the, we'd call you a billy tail. Yeah, but after today, I'm probably 18 months away from a man bun. I don't know. You ain't got enough to work with with a, with a hairdresser now that you cut it all off, though. Hey, I was going to interview for the ombudsman job. Okay. Well, do you think he, you can do it? Well, yeah, I thought about it, but I got a little worried when I found out that Charlie Manson had to go to prison for what all them morons did just because he told them to. So I don't want to be responsible for anybody's behavior out there, you know? Yeah, well, listen, I don't think you have to worry about uh, prison. Um, I mean, being the ombudsman of the show means you just basically correct all the mistakes and, uh, and analyze whether we're doing the right or wrong thing. Well, Jim had a, a grammatical error in his little... Uh, from what I heard, now I didn't see the actual print, but I thought it, he wrote it his junior year. It, it, there, it's exactly how it sounds. Yeah, you know, listen, I mean, when Steve, I I, I'm always it, nervous. Uh, I used to be, I used to write for a living, and any time I would send my article to the copy desk, I mean, ba- I don't mean to upset anyone, but you got people on the copy desk who basically sit around and look at at at. Uh, at grammar books all day long uh, and so i mean if we ended up having to penalize people on the show because of mistakes of grammar i don't i don't think any of us including me uh would be able to uh function at all well as the ombudsman i would have considered the fact that oh matt might have had a point though and I would have had Jim reread it and see if maybe he thought he heard what the other guy heard, just to be fair to both of them. Hey, yeah. I got a question about uh, Georgia football. I, I noticed y'all are talking a lot about them. I'm up here in Knoxville, so I'm not that aware of their schedule. But, God, it looked kind of light. I think they had a North Louisiana Votech School of Barbary and Dentistry on there. Yeah, when, they, when do they uh, play a hard game? The sixth yeah, one? They, they usually – remember remember back in the uh, in the old days you you would play service teams? Um, I think a service team would beat some of the teams on their schedule. The, the Georgia schedule is pretty embarrassing. Austin P. I I mean, joke. Middle Tennessee is actually a pretty good program. Oh, come on. For a SEC school? Well, I'm no, from I mean, Tennessee. they're uh, – uh, they beat Vandy last. Was it last year they beat Vandy or the year before? Two years ago. Um, is Vanderbilt an SEC still? Uh, I'll double check. Uh, <laughs> now UMass, UMass is a total joke, and Georgia Tech is uh, is a half joke. That 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 is yeah, but, a that that is a disgraceful non conference schedule. I have to agree with you. Well, I mean, now they're going to have their hands full at Auburn and their hands full. Yeah, but that comes uh, with the territory. That's right. That's now, right. By, by the I way, mean, now hold on a second. Are you, are, you, are you a Tennessee fan or an Alabama fan? Well, I'm. I, uh, my whole life, I've been hoping to be a Tennessee fan, but okay. I wasn't born in the '40s, so yeah, you know, yeah, I would. Yeah, I'm kind of like I'm you, uh, Steve. In my lifetime, I've seen Tennessee have one really good year, and uh, I missed all the fifty, the early '50s, and the mid '50s, and the '40s, and the '30s. Um, but Alabama's schedule is not a whole lot better, just to, treat, just to keep this real. I mean, we, we, we talked about the lightness of Georgia's schedule, but Alabama uh, opens with Louisville. Uh, that's, not a, that's not a quality opponent. And after that, it's, it's one cupcake after another. Yeah, we're, we're the Big Ten's going to be making fun of us if we're not They are, careful. they are. Now, yeah. now, Tennessee, <laughs> now, Tennessee, to its credit uh, – Pretty good opening game against West Virginia. For them, yeah. Well, yeah, for Tennessee. Now, if I was in Alabama uh, or Georgia, it wouldn't be. But, again, uh, every, everything's uh, relative. Hey, thanks, Steve. Do appreciate it. Jay is up next. What do you say, Jay? Jay, you there? Here, I'm here. How you doing, sir? Uh, we are doing great. Thank you. Yes, we got disconnected yesterday, and I uh, just wanted to uh, finish up everything. I, the way to beat a eight eight uh, man in the box uh, defense is to throw seam routes and crossing routes. 
Okay. Uh, Kirby Smart just out coached Debo. That's all that happened in the first half. So watch this spring. I see just from the pictures. I haven't seen any like uh, uh, video on anything. You told us, Jay, you were a former quarterback. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. So go ahead and keep former. explaining. Yeah, I'm gonna keep it plain. Uh, quarterbacks, uh, you can have a bad half, uh, but the, uh, the the offensive coordinator has to call the right plays for you. So that's what happened in that first half. But I just don't want Alabama fans to get upset because you got two great quarterbacks. It's not bad to have two great quarterbacks. It's that the play calling in the first half was wrong. If we see the, the touchdown passes in the second half, that was seam route. The touchdown pass that won the game was a seam route in between the safety and cornerback. That's, I mean, the crossing route to really that he uh, he was trying to throw it to the tight end. Nobody ever discussed that, but really caught it. It was a crossing route. So that's how you beat an eight man front. So Kirby Smart is our coach. They both the whole time. That's what happened with that. And uh, so what, ha- what offense, happened in the second half? He changed his calling, and I really believe that the analyst got in because he was really they changed the whole game plan. So I want them to very to watch the spring and the uh, preseason real closely because Loxley's plan is to ride the running back a whole lot more. It's more of a read offense than uh, normal. So it's going to be a re- if you watch how they ride the running back when they run the read option, it's more of a read option offense. So it's going to be more to Jalen's advantage because he's a running quarterback than Tua. But Tua is ready. I love Tua and I love Jalen. I love both of them, but I'm just trying to tell people that it's not. It was not necessarily that Tua was ready. It was the play calling in the first half. You cannot be the eight man front without running seam routes and crossing routes, and they delayed uh, running back to Jacobs. They ran that a couple of times. Uh, Vanderbilt in another game they ran it to Jacobs out of the backfield. Delayed uh, seam route running back. That plan, that that would have wore Georgia out because they stacked the line, but they didn't run it. So that's what happened. He just got out coach. That's all that was. That's all it was. Well done. Hey, thank you very much. Appreciate it. And welcome all back uh, to the program. We uh, have a lot to deal with today, more of your calls and certainly more guests to come. We showed you a headline a couple hours ago uh, in an article by uh, Tom Fernelli, and it is really some interesting stuff here about this new kickoff rule in college football. First, we're going to explain it. I'll let Tom explain it. I would never get it right. And he has some suggestions. Tom, thanks for the time. Uh, good afternoon, and I hope your spring has been a good one. How are you? I Actually, spring's been pretty awful, Paul. It's, right now I'm in Chicago, and it's snowing out oh. April 18th. So yeah, we've you know, had better spring. I've complained where, where I am in the south that it's, uh, we, we have, I think today is the first 80-degree day. It's been uh, 40s and 50s, but uh, I think I was reading someplace about uh, Major League Baseball is close to a record already. and We're only uh, on the 18th day of April on postponements, probably most of them in your town. <laughs> yeah, well, the White Sox were actually in Minnesota over the weekend, and the entire series was canceled because of snow. So it's, it's been that kind of fun, quote-unquote, spring in the Midwest so far. Well, I won't ask again. Uh, Tom, thanks for being with us. Uh, before we get to your, some of your ideas, explain this new kickoff rule to our audience. Well, essentially what the new rule is, or it used to be on a kickoff, if you caught the ball in the end zone and you knelt or you just didn't come out, it was a touchback and you'd get the ball to 2025, 20, wherever it was at the time. Now they're changing it to you can catch the ball in anywhere inside the 25-yard line call a fair catch or just kneel, and it's going to be a touchback. So if a returner catches the ball at the five-yard line and kneels, the team's going to get the ball at the 25. And the reason they're implementing this rule is because what they say is, you know, they're trying to cut down on injuries because data and studies show that more severe injuries occur more frequently on kickoffs than any other play, which I think, you know, if that's your goal, if it's to help alleviate injuries, that's a, it's a worthy, noble goal. It's just, I don't think that's what this rule change is going to do. I honestly, maybe it will, but I honestly don't see this change having an effect on the amount of injury simply because players are blocking and running down the field and hitting each other long before they know what the returner is going to do. I think that what this rule is really being implemented for is that I would wager at least 80% of kickoffs at this point are now going to end up with touchbacks. And we're going to see where 
kickoffs kind of become just a pointless exercise. So that way, in the next, in, whether it's in a year or two down the line, when they just get rid of kickoffs altogether, which is what I think the end point is, it won't be as drastic of a change because I think the you know football fans, college football fans, will be so used to kickoffs being meaningless anyway that they'll be crying for it at that point. They'll say, well, let's just get rid of it if this is what we're going to do. And I honestly think that's what the plan is here. So what should be done, and, and how do you overcome this? Well, the, my proposal was if you're going to get rid of kickoffs, and frankly I'm not really 100% into the idea, but if it will cut down on injuries, great. I think that's good for the sport in the long run. But my proposal would just be base starting field position off of what the team who just scored did. So if you have the ball and you kick a field goal, the opposing team would then start with the ball through 30, and that way, you know, it's kind of it, it brings a little strategy into it so that way if you kick the field goal yes you're getting points on the board but you're giving better field position to your opponent than if you just scored a touchdown and i have it tiered where if you scored a touchdown from within the, within the 20 yard line the team would start with the ball at the 25 just like they do now with a touchback if you scored from a 21 to 40 yards out they would get the ball at the 20 yard line from 41 plus yards you'd get the ball at the 15 so essentially, you're punishing the other team more than just putting points on the board. You're affecting their starting field position based on whether you, you scored a 45-yard touchdown or if you just scored a two-yard touchdown. And then also, like with pick sixes or punt returns, the other team would start at the 15 as well. And I think that what that would do is it would kind of change the strategy a bit. I think it would make coaches want to be a little more aggressive, particularly on fourth down, because they know that the field goal might help them with three points on the board, but it might be it might have a greater effect to go for that first down and try to get the touchdown to pin your opponent back even further. Tom Fernelli with CBS uh, talking about the new rule. Let's get be, uh, beyond that because uh, after the kickoff, the actual game occurs. Um, college football is a, is a fascinating sport, but you know, especially where I live, it seems like it's uh, we're on a merry-go-round with the same three or four schools getting off and on the the uh, the ride you're in chicago a little bit uh, more broad based uh, your, your view of college football right now as we begin to head into another season you know it's probably not all that much different than yours i'm looking at alabama and georgia trying to figure out which one of those two will win the sec and then they'll likely have to go through clemson to get there really out here the only question is is Ohio State going to win the Big Ten, or is Michigan finally going to have a year that's worth having as far as the hype that Jim Harbaugh has received in his time there? So I, I would say up here, yeah, it's, our picture's not all that different from what you're probably dealing with on a daily basis. And the debate has been uh, whether people have any control over it or not, and they don't, uh, whether this SEC Alabama domination is really good for the game. Uh, it, maybe it's more Saban. I, I don't know what it is, but but how do you see it? It's. I mean, I I understand where people come from when they when they question that, but honestly, I don't know how it's any different now than it's ever been. Because if you look at college football just throughout its entire history, at any given time, going into any season, are there ever really more than five teams that you considered a legitimate? tender to win a national title and I think the only thing that's different now is that Nick Saban and Alabama have been dominant for so long I think that's what's different is we're not used to seeing one team on top for as long as Alabama has been but I think generally I don't think it's a bad thing for college football to have a dominant team I don't think it's a bad thing for any sport to have a dominant team because at the end of the day that's what people want to tune in for whether you're rooting for that team or you're rooting against that team I think it's important for any sport to have a team that controls, you know, the tempo, if you will, of the season. And I think that Alabama has been that. We've seen Clemson come along and provide a real challenge for Alabama in recent years. And I think it's good that Georgia now is taking a trajectory where Alabama has more of a stiff competition within its own conference at the SEC, because as we've seen in recent years in the SEC West, which used to absolutely dominate the landscape, we've seen the other teams in that division kind of falter a little bit. And I think it's good for Georgia to step up and provide that competition. So I think it's always good to have the dominant teams, but it always makes things a little more interesting when there is more questions. So whether it's Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State, Oklahoma, or if anybody from the Pac-12 can find the consistency to be a real competitor year in and year out, I think that's always good. But I don't think it's a problem to have a dominant team, though. Tom, if you walked into a, a bar on a Saturday night on Rush Street or wherever in, in, in Chicago and Alabama's playing somebody – 
Uh, and assuming that Notre Dame has already played, uh, would you say more people are rooting uh, against Alabama than for Alabama? Against, by far. I mean, I, I think that's just the nature of the sports fan. It's if unless you are an Alabama fan, or unless you are the fan of the team that's the dominant team, you want to root against that team. It makes it more fun, and it's also since. It's a rarity when they lose. When they do lose, if you actually root against them, it, it, it makes it feel a little bit better. But, no, I think if you walk into any bar in Chicago during, on a Saturday during the fall, there are going to be more people rooting against Alabama than for them, unless they're playing somebody like Michigan or Notre Dame simply because there's that rivalry within the city here because there are so many Michigan and Notre Dame fans. Might also be true if you walked into a bar anywhere in the South as well, outside of Alabama. Um, Tom, we appreciate you coming on. Uh, maybe maybe the temperature will reach 40 tomorrow and you can get outside. I'll, I'll bust out the shorts and the T-shirt if it does. And we welcome you back. Glad you're here. And uh, more phone calls at 855-242-7285. Always looking for interesting calls, people we haven't heard from in a while. And uh, we have that right now. Phyllis is up next. How are you, Phyllis? Hey, Paul, how are you doing? Phyllis, we are great. Tell us about you. I'm I'm doing better. I'm just taking one day at a time by the grace of God. And, but Paul, I just wanted to touch on something. I I got really upset a while ago when, when Jim called, and he was so disrespectful to you. And he, he calls in at nowadays, well, he always has, but he's worse now about calling your show and trying to run the show like he's in your seat and you're on the other end of the phone. Um, I didn't appreciate the way Jim talked to you earlier. He was arrogant, and he caused everybody else a moron. He acted moronic. And, you know, I just wanted to say this, Paul. I know how bad Jim hates women. But, hey, Jim, I know you're listening. This is a woman. And I'm going to tell you something, punk. If you don't quit disrespecting Paul, ESPN, SEC, this entire network, I will push my wheelchair all the way to Tuscaloosa, and I will beat you half to death with my oxygen tank. Do you hear me, you little punk? That's all you are. There's nothing to you. There's nothing extremely great about you. You're no better than anyone else. God loves me, Paul, and everybody else just as much as he loves you. So come down off that ego ladder you're on because you're a little bit too high. Your head's in the clouds too much. And, Paul, thank you for giving me a minute to tell him that. I I love y'all. I love you. And roll tide. Row tide forever. Thanks, Phyllis. You you continue. Uh, we'll talk to you God soon. God bless you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Hi, man. Is up next. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Paul Feinbaum. You know, Paul, I've been around you several times, but I never noticed those clouds around your waist. I, I figured Jim just had his head up your butt. I didn't know they were called clouds, but I guess you are a cloudy kind of day. Sunshine. On a Shall we day. gather at the river? Shall we gather? Throw down them damn crutches of man's life, Jim. You know, Paul, in 1959, when Jim was a junior in high school, I wasn't even two years hey, I old. Man, uh, correction, was 62, according to the record. Well, the tweet says 59. Well, no, we, we've corrected that. No, we haven't. You just think you have. I tell you, you, you sure you sure do protect that little old rascal. I mean, to be such an old fart like he is, what kind of? Let me ask you this: What kind of injury do you have to sustain at twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen years old to completely ruin and make you a bitter person the rest of your life? Well, I guess you could start with a head injury. That would be a good one. And the second but one would I be... Think, I think he his, said once, uh, I mean, that it was a hand injury. And he probably got his nads caught on a fence. That would do it, too, I reckon. Could be. I mean, can you, Could be. I mean a head injury and a nad injury all in the same motion. Because he was hanging head down. So he probably hit his head on the ground and, I, and then I, fell I, I thought he said he, hurt, he put his hand through a window. A window? 
Well, yeah, that too. that's what he's that, that that's what he said, Winder. And and you know, I love it when he quotes me because he's been riding my coattails forever. But for this man to be this bitter for this long, I mean, to have and and you've got young guys now calling this program, and you never hear them complain. Never hear them complain. They call in, and, and, and I mean, Jim has even got to the point that he's attacking a 10-year-old child for calling in your program, and you just said he was a great caller. He's a 10-year-old. But these kids never complain. They never complain. And, and that's an amazing thing to me. you got this bitter old fart over here, and then you got these kids coming up. Jim, that's the future. They are the future of this program. You are the long has been worn out, never could have been complainer. And and I just what in 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 the medical world could you diagnose that other than damn crazy? We are the Auburn Tigers. And Paul, let me. I know you're going to be all tuned into Alabama a day. And I know that now it's common for everyone to say, well, Alabama's schedule is a little down. Nick Saban has been doing this kind of scheduling since he's been there. He loves the team in transition. Now you've got two quarterbacks, one that has a lost far away look in her eyes, wondering if this is Kansas or not. And then the other one, he's got fragile fingers, fragile fingers. Have a good day, War Damn Eagle. <sighs> Millie is Hi, up Paul. next. Hello, Millie. Hi, Paul. Uh, oh, it was so good to see Phyllis on. How is she doing? Is she, what did you, uh, what did you think about what she said about uh, Jim? Well, I agree with her. She I said, think... Uh, she said she's going to roll her wheelchair uh, up there and beat him with her oxygen tank. Well, uh, if I had the chance, uh, I would take Sam and uh, follow her uh, on her uh, coattails or whatever. That's my walker, by the way. I don't know. Does she have a name for her chair? I haven't asked her yet, but I will. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, you were talking earlier today about going on a cruise. You're going to love it. I mean, uh, being on a ship is so much fun. Never never been uh, on a cruise, Millie. Well, I wasn't on a cruise. I was going from uh, uh, German. I mean, the, from the United States to Germany back in 1955. Uh, yeah, that doesn't was, exactly sound like a Norwegian cruise. <laughs> well, it was fun. We were there on the on the ship for a week, and my mother hated it like crazy because she was so scared of the water. But I thought it was a lot of fun uh, leaning over and seeing. Well, Millie, the ocean. can we count you? Uh, can we count you in if we uh, if we have a fine bomb cruise? Yeah, it would be a lot of fun. Uh, uh, there isn't anything that you can't, uh, with the way they do things today, it's a lot more fun than, uh, than of course, I guess, going to Germany or something. But uh, the ships are yeah, really a lot of Yeah, I thought the final night of the cruise, we could have a cage match between Phyllis and... And we welcome all of you back. Glad you're here. 855-242-7285 is the number. It's been a pretty exciting first two hours. Let's uh, keep it rolling. Larry uh, is on the, the uh, phone. And Larry is up next. Go right ahead, Larry. Hey, Paul. I saw the picture of the cruise ship. What what am I at on there, Jack? Uh, uh, Larry, we took the people outside. You were inside at the bar. Oh, I thought I might be driving that bad boy. I have have, uh, been a helmsman on a... a big destroyer, you know, guided it. Do you have a uh, crew, uh, do you have a, a, a license? Yes, yes, sir. Captain You're in. Well, uh, <laughs> I feel sorry for any other boats out there or any small countries if you're in charge, but you got the job. <laughs> All right. Oh, man. We'll crash I'm, right I'm, into I'm, uh, I'm, Cuba at the, way, at the rate we're going. Yeah, baby. I know this is squirrel word about how many visitors. Squirrel, if you want these empty cans, I'll, I'll save them for you. I didn't know he collected cans, you know, keeping up with how many I drank, but. Uh, my God, that man, when he calls in, you know, he calls in about, is there about Millie or, uh, Jim? If you crack this head open, a little naked Jim's would run out with no faces on them. I mean, a man's eat up with the Jim syndrome and Millie and just talk about football or somebody. You don't have to monitor my call. Paul does that. He does that button over there when he gets tired of listening to me. So just do your own thing and leave me alone, Jack. And Dan, what's up, brother? You going we gonna be on a cruise together? <laughs> Dan. Hey, 
I would go on a cruise with you anytime, Larry, but I'm not sure I'm going to let you be the helmsman just based on some of your what? other proclivities. <laughs> I'm, I'm oh, sure you got the experience, but I, you and me at the bar, that sounds a lot more better than uh, you steering the ship on that Larry, one. we will let you uh, be in charge from about 7 to 9 a.m., and after that I think we're going to have to take the, uh, the wheel away Hell. from you. Oh, man, that's the sad thing. Y'all can see me. Uh, y'all to watch me, man, when I park it. I mean, so, Larry, tell me, about your, uh, tell me about your experience at sea. Oh, yeah, yeah. I had a uh, – we were uh, tied up next to an aircraft carrier, and we crashed into it, and I was on the helms. I was uh, you were part, the ship. So, uh, so you helped crash into uh, an aircraft carrier? Yeah, well, the captain gave me the order. You have any idea? You have any idea how 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 much those things cost, Larry? I know, man, but I didn't take the heat for it. He did. What he done? He turned left full rudder too soon and uh, too late, and it didn't take. Now, now, when when and where was this? It was over Westpac cruise over and over the west western part of the world. Uh, the West Pack, where Japan and all that is. And, Larry, you know, it's been 50 years. You can tell it's no longer any state secrets. We have good relations so with all those countries. Well, I have to be careful. FBI, CIA. Yeah, no, but, no Larry, we're, we're good with Japan, okay? We're Vietnam. Okay. Well, yeah. North Korea, you got to worry well, about. We're, we're, hey, we're good with them, too. We, we, you we're, think so? We're about to be, or at least we, we're about to be good with them. Yeah, but I, it we was got, We got close. Jim from Tuscaloosa over there right now meeting with Kim. <laughs> Den- uh, De- De- Dennis Rodman you, wasn't available. <laughs> uh, you the man, Paul. <laughs> Who helped me come up with that? I made it with Cam Young. <laughs> <laughs> I won't ask you how to spell that because I don't know how either. Oh, good. I'm glad. I know, it's, I, know it's, I, know it's, I know it starts with a K. I know, Matt. We straightened him out a little bit. Maybe I got him too far off. Straight rudder. He, he, maybe he would go back a little bit. I didn't mean to scare him, you know, because uh, we plan on meeting up in Atlanta. So he okay, might Larry, scare him. Uh, save save your breath. You sound like you're a little bit out of oxygen there. Arthur is up next. Welcome to the show, Arthur. Good afternoon. How are you doing, Paul? We are great. Thank you. Hey, I was just calling in. I was just so glad to hear from Phil. Uh, I don't know if you remember. I called you uh, back several months ago, and uh, I was actually Phyllis's next door neighbor back in the day. You were? Did you say you were Phyllis's next door neighbor? I was Phyllis's next door neighbor in Logan, and Phyllis actually took care of my dad when my dad got sick. We were in between getting my dad in a nursing home, and Phyllis actually took care of my dad at my house. For uh, several months until we could get him in a nursing home. So uh, anybody wants that wants to uh, downgrade Phyllis and talk about her, hey, I'm here. Hey, that is the sweetest woman I've ever met. In my life. No, you're right. Listen, I, I've met her a number of times, Arthur. I couldn't agree more. Hey, thank you very much. Don in Memphis is next up. Uh, hey, Don. Hello, Mr. Powell. How are you? Yes, doing fine, sir. I will hope you are. I want to kind of gripe about these new rules they're trying to put sure, in no there. Idea. I'm ti- I'm kind of tired. I like to see the old football and let them play football, you know? Get rid of the uh, review. I called you here a while back and said something about that because it just makes the game longer. It stops some of the drives. It works both ways, and the referees do a fine job anyhow, I think. Well, I think they do too. Uh, I mean, I'm not a, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm not against reviews, but they, they have to do them quicker, though. Uh, they just waste too much time. Absolutely, and I, you know, I don't want people getting hurt either. But football is a rough game, and oh, yeah. if they start playing flag football, I don't believe I'll be watching it. <laughs> no, no, you're right. Uh, it's a, it's a pretty, it's a brutal game, in fact, and. Uh, I know their intent is good, and, and thanks for the call. I mean, all this. Uh, Concussion protocol conversation is serious stuff. Uh, it's uh, put the NFL in, in, in real danger, and college football is not that far behind. But uh, I'm not sure uh, this is going to be the answer. Hey, thanks for the call. I do appreciate it. Frank 
in Georgia. You are on the air. Go right ahead, Frank. Thank you for taking my call, Mr. Feinbaum. Thank you. I wanted to talk about uh, Alabama's schedule. Okay. Uh, no, I know there's uh, a lot of callers that think that uh, the schedule is uh, not formidable as it would be. But when I look back at last year when we played Florida State, it was the most hyped game uh, for the first game. It was the most hyped game in college football, Alabama. Number two, no doubt. Well, Alabama was number uh, one. Florida State was number three. Right, right. And and it, it, after that, you know, we went through our schedule, and there wasn't a lot talked about it. But it seems that that you know, this year with uh, uh, us having uh, Louisville as our first game, I mean, Coach Saban has uh, has scheduled or a lot. Uh, Top 25 teams throughout since he's well, been at Alabama. Is you know, that correct? You know, uh, he has played a uh, an incredibly difficult schedule, Frank. I mean, he uh, outside of one year uh, since 2008, I think it was 11, he played Kent. He's played a, uh, a legitimate opponent. I mean, everyone from Michigan to Florida State to Southern Cal. I mean, it, it's uh, it's been the best the best you can possibly get. Louisville is, uh, two years ago would have, would have been a really good game. This year, it just doesn't sound like very much. The issue isn't. So much the schedule. Here's the issue. If Alabama loses a game anywhere in the season, can they overcome that? Uh, and I think that's the challenge that they're going to have. Let's say they lose to LSU or lose to Auburn. Can they, can they come back uh, if they lose the championship game? You know, in years past, they've, been able, they've had that luxury. They could, two years ago, they could have lost the SEC championship game, and they would have still gotten in. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, isn't that every year? I, uh, no, no, we, no. We, well, no, it's not every year because, uh, I mean, last year uh, they, they got in with one loss. But my point is that some years their schedule is good enough and the SEC is strong enough that they can overcome it. This may not be one of those years. Yes, sir. SEC being strong, that, that, that is true. Um, I, I, Coach Saban is a is – a, Tremendous coach. Uh, it's, it, it, it almost like when you listen to ESPN and other uh, Fox Sports, they make it seem like that we're trying to set up ourselves an easy schedule so that we can have a clear run to. Well, I, the, I don't, I, uh, listen, uh, Frank. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't totally agree with that. Uh, I just think it's some fans who are. I mean, I don't think any legitimate commentator is is suggesting that an SEC schedule is an easy schedule. It is not. Uh, an SEC schedule is littered with landmines all across. It's what they focus on. And, again, the media the media is a pack, and they tend to go in, in directions. And last year they turned on Alabama because the Florida State game didn't turn out to be a challenge after the fact. It was, it was a tough game. Alabama struggled to get ahead in that game. They, get, they got ahead on a couple of turnovers and mistakes that they helped to create. Welcome back. Glad you're here. Let's uh, continue more calls. Justin is calling next. Justin is in Cleveland. Welcome to our program. How are you, Justin? I'm doing well, Paulie Ballgame. Hey, I'm thinking what the Paul Feinbaum show needs is some sort of ombudsman. Now, that's more than like a fact checker like we were talking about previously. This is someone like an ombudsman of a hospital who then relates to the patients if they have a complaint. I think we need someone independently reaching out to the I-mans and the squirrels of the world and Jim and just being a sounding board because all I've heard out of folks lately is how bad the Paul Feinbaum show is, and I quite enjoy it. So what I'd like to do, Paul, <laughs> my, my, work, my work takes me to Alabama one week out of the month, the rest okay. of the time out here, here in sunny Cleveland, Ohio, is I want to fill that role for you. I want to be the Paul Feinbaum show ombudsman. Yeah, by the way, uh, ombudsmen's also, they, they're, you're right, they are not fact checkers. Uh, they also uh, take consumer complaints, investigate them, and really put, keep everyone, including uh, the talent on the program or the executives at wherever you are, uh, on their toes. So, yeah, I mean, if you want the job, Justin, uh, you got it. I appreciate that, Paul, and I think it'll doesn't be a great pay, service. Doesn't pay, doesn't have take- benefits. You pay. Uh, uh, you have to take a bus, um, and we'll make. We will give you a twelve dollar a day per diem, same as we get, and uh, you're in good shape. Uh, hey, twelve dollars can buy me what half a rack of ribs at Dreamland. I'll take that. 
Uh, we'll get you covered there. All right, Paul. Well, I'll start my work, and I'll uh, provide you weekly updates on where we stand. I'll start by reaching out to Jim, um, and we'll go from there. You're, you, uh, look forward to hearing from you. Thanks, Justin. Jimmy is in Chicago, where uh, we've already been today, and we understand the weather's still not very good. Yeah, another Chamber of Commerce uh, spring day in Chicago. Uh, wind chill, mid-20s, freezing rain, <laughs> uh, two inches of snow expected tonight. Uh, yeah, got to love it. Well, but, but spring's around the corner. Yeah, that's what I've been hearing for the last three or four weeks. And, and winter but, isn't that far off either. No, this is a week one into the sixth month of uh, a winter weather. So, uh, no, I'm not holding my breath. But uh, don't. I tell you, no, I am not. You know, I really uh, enjoyed your uh, conversation yesterday with the statistic guy. Was his name Dan? Uh, 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 Bart- uh, Dave, Dave Bartow. Or oh, Dave. Dave. He was fantastic. We got. We have to get him back. I tell you what, man, that, that was really a fascinating conversation talking about uh, Saban bringing, you know, the, the coordinators that, you know, he, he has uh, uh, in, in that capacity uh, this year. And I, I tell you, he, he really has some good points. I mean, when you when you look at Lotsley's track record as an offensive coordinator uh, at Maryland, I mean, it was underwhelming to say the least. But, you know, I think that's going to be, though, more than balanced uh, with the good fortune Alabama had to be able to bring in Dan Enos as a a quarterback's coach because he is one of the best, I think, best quarterback coaches in the country. What he did with the Allen brothers at Arkansas was just short of remarkable. I mean, he, 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 he really, especially the older Allen brother, uh, he ended up being drafted by the Jaguars, and I think he got picked up by the Rams uh, uh, in, in the off season. And I mean, he, his senior year, uh, I think it was uh, yeah three years ago. I really thought he was last six weeks of the season. He's the best quarterback in the SEC. Uh, but this is a guy that is really going to help someone like Tua, uh, uh, who's already a very gifted passer, and I think really. He'll, he'll help a guy like uh, Jalen, too, with him because I really thought Jalen's biggest, biggest issue throwing the balls with his footwork. He's got a strong arm. And, you know, if you just have somebody that, that, that's really good with the fundamentals, uh, I, I think he could improve in that aspect tremendously, although, he, you know, he's obviously not a naturally gifted passer, but I think – I think uh, he, he would improve a lot. But think about but with Tosh, I think Tosh is going to do a great job. I think people don't realize that five short years ago, uh, Jeremy Pruitt had never been a defensive coordinator. No, so, so and true. He goes right off the get-go, his first defensive coordinator gig at Florida State that won the national championship. Then after that one year, the uh, – uh, the coordinator job uh, becomes open at Georgia, I think, when Grantham left. He's there two years. And then I thought his two, his two seasons at Alabama were absolutely sensational. Of course, Kirby did a great job at Alabama. But I thought with Jeremy, Alabama was much more aggressive, especially turning loose pass rushers like Tim Williams and last year, they would have been even more effective had they not lost their two best pass rushers, Christian Miller and uh, Terrell Lewis, in the opener and, uh, against Florida State uh, and, and missed them for the whole season until they got him back for the playoffs. So I think Tosh is going to be very much in that mold, and Alabama defensively will really remain uh, very, very good. But it was, but it was uh, – a really, really interesting discussion about the different stats involved with different uh, uh, coaches, and I also I'm in- interested to see how Jeremy's assistants are are at Tennessee. Although that first year with that schedule, you mentioned you talked to Fulmer about it. It's it's not going to be a pretty first year, but I think Jeremy's going to get very good players on the recruiting trail, and in a couple of years, I, I think they're going to be in a position to be. Uh, to be competitive, but I, I was, it was really a change of pace interview that you often, from what you often have with your guest, and he brought a lot of great points that you often, you know, don't hear. No, you know, one thing he did, uh, and you, you know me, uh, Jimmy, one thing I hate 
is uh, yeah, Alabama could really be a good team, but you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they lost a game or two or three or four. I mean, that, right. that, uh, this guy was just cutting to the point, uh, no fat on the bone. Uh, and I thought he, he really, you know, Alabama is Alabama, but, but he did raise some issues about uh, the coordinators, and he's not the first one to bring that up. Yeah, and also the guy from uh, SEC country, I did the same thing regarding Mississippi State. He shouldn't, yeah, I that thought, guy, no matter what you asked him, he was going to answer, Mississippi State is going to be great. Well, I tell you what, Moorhead is an outstanding offensive coach, and he made, I think McSorley, you can ask John about this, but I, I think McSorley already, he's the best quarterback in Penn State history. And I've seen a lot of Penn State quarterbacks, and I, I'm talking Blackledge, I mean, he's right at that level, at least as a college quarterback. And I think with Fitzgerald and the weapons they have on offense, I think I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Looking at state schedule, that they could have a really big season. I mean, they've 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 got a lot of weapons to work with. So yeah, the fact that he was talking like that instead of saying, "Well, if this goes right." If it, this goes the way they hope it does, then they can oh, win yeah. that many. No, that, that, that is, uh, I, mean, that. I mean, we live in that world. And again, I don't mean to be uh, indicting all the people uh, with whom I work uh, across the board, but that stuff gets pretty tiresome. Yeah, and I tell you what, I, I, LSU, if I was an LSU fan, I would really be concerned because it's going to be up to a roundup with that defense, I think, to carry this program because – Man, that switch from Canada to where they're at right now, man, oh, man, I would be concerned about that. Yeah, uh, you and, know, I, I've yet to hear a suitable explanation for that. Uh, to me, uh, that just goes right back to the, the, the issue that Ed Orgeron had years ago. It seems like he's just ret- he's going back to the future. Well, you know, it seemed like he'd taken a turn away from that when he was the interim uh, head coach at USC, you know, he really became very uh, player-friendly and so forth. He let Helton handle the offense. Then he brings in Canada, who had done a remarkable job in one season with Nathan Peterman at, at Pitt. I mean, turning him into a, a draft pick. And, uh, and, and then he just gets his fingers involved in it and just – it just messed up the the entire chemistry, and uh, like I think the week leading up to the Troy game, he stepped in and wouldn't allow any of uh, like the pre play motion that Canada likes to use before the snap. They didn't do any of that, and it just took the complete pl- uh, flow out of their offense. And then after that loss, he kind of let him go back to that. And I thought by the end of the year, he did a really good job with Epling. But you, you just. You, Orgeron's a defensive coach. Yes. Jimmy, we hate to run. We're up against a break. We have an important guest coming up, and we welcome you back. Uh, We have all type of guests uh, on this program, but our next guest, Zach Schoenbrunn from the New York Times, uh, has just come out with a a book entitled The Performance Cortex. Yeah, I'm already losing sight of what this is about uh, before you are. The uh, subtitle, How Neuroscience is Redefining athletic genius there was a big piece on it in in the times of course where he works the other day and under the heading how do athletes brains control their movements for someone like me who can barely walk down the street and chew gum at the same time i am really anxious to uh, find out more about this subject uh, zach congratulations on the book uh critically acclaimed we appreciate your time and good afternoon thank you paul great to speak with you thank you um I, I'm usually in an interview. I, I, I make believe that I'm cognizant of the subject. So I, I, but but in this one, I'm throwing my hands up and, and say, I, I mean, I think I understand the concept, and I've read the Times piece. But to, to not to confuse the audience, but in, in order to enlighten them, I'm, I'm going to ask you to explain the odyssey of, of doing this book and, and how you came about the idea, and what process did you go through in order to report and ultimately publish. Yeah, well, I, listen, I feel your pain. I mean, when I got started with this, I, I didn't have any neuroscience background uh, whatsoever. I've been a sports uh, journalist, as you mentioned, for the New York Times and, and other places for most of my uh, career. And, and, you know, the way this, this started was I noticed in a, an alumni magazine 
a little blurb about these two neuroscientists that were starting to do some work with Major League Baseball teams. And, you know, I'd heard about, uh, you know, brain gaming, kind of like the Lumosity type of stuff that had been uh, going around and starting to get more popular among sports teams. And, and obviously mindfulness training and sports psychology and Zen master stuff has been popularized in, in sports in recent years. But the idea that these were neuroscientists uh, that were starting to actually figure out a way to peel back the helmet so to speak, of, of a baseball hitter and, and see what's going on in their brains as they're making decisions to swing or not swing at a pitch. I just thought that was really unique and, and, and sort of a sign of what might be to come in sports. And, and they were using uh, an EEG, which is a brain imaging device. It looks like a kind of like a metallic hairnet. And they're using it uh, with uh, with major league. Uh, I'm excuse me, not major league, but minor league uh, hitters, and uh, and you know they're able to discern when these hitters are deciding to swing or not to swing. And so, you know, writing a story about them uh, led uh, me to this uh, kind of an awakening and this understanding that it's not so much about the physical. Uh, attributes that define uh, athletes, uh, even though that's what we're used to uh, gawking and, and uh, remarking about um, their physical statures and their speed and quickness uh, and so on. Those are all contributions, but what's really underlying their performance uh, is all taking place inside their brains. Some critics have compared, and this is a tremendous compliment, uh, compared this thought process to Moneyball. Now, obviously, it's a totally different concept, uh, the great book uh, by Michael Lewis, which really changed baseball in many ways. Uh, I know that we're talking about the, the science of statistics uh, and probability versus the science of science, so to speak, uh, but how widespread is this? And I know this is a big what-if question. Where do you see it going? Yeah, so, you know, what, what DeServo, the, the company that I followed for the last three years uh, that is that's founded by the two neuroscientists um, who I originally wrote about, what they're able to do is they, they initially got started here not promising any performance benefits uh, with, their, with their program. They were simply a data company. They were providing information to teams that, to this point, had not had access to that information, and that was information that was happening inside the brain's of these hitters. And so they were giving the teams the opportunity to, to decide what they wanted to do with it. And there are two things that teams could decide to do. They could say, all right, we're going to use, we, we're going to test our hitters and see what they respond to neurally um, to, to different pitches. They say they, they're able to break down fastball, curveball, slider, and see how they're responding to those pitches and say, okay, if we see that this guy is not responding quickly enough or, or, or is not responding to the level of maybe his teammates, can we work with him to improve that decision-making ability? And so you can reverse engineer, essentially, and use it as a training tool. And then the other avenue that teams were thinking about going, and I think this is where kind of the money ball uh, starts to get involved, is that you might be able to figure out a baseline for what does it take to be a major leaguer or at least a successful major leaguer in terms of uh, that decision-making ability. There's a small window in the timeline of a pitch that you have to decide to swing or not swing at that pitch. And these major leaguers, they live in that window, but you might be able to, to see – uh, if there's a prospect coming up, if and you can, you, know, you might be able to test, uh, you know, prospects and use that uh, that baseline as a screening or assessment method to figure out whether or not uh, future players can uh, can uh, successfully perform in the major leagues. So the servo was providing these teams uh, the the opportunity to go one of two ways. Um, at this point. Teams are kind of tiptoeing back and forth, for trying to figure out which way is the way to go. It's still very nascent, though, Paul. We're still really at the forefront of this, uh, you know, revolution, this brain science revolution in, in sports. So I think it's something that bears watching over the years to come. Yeah, I mean, it, it is absolutely fascinating to hear about, Zach. Now, I know I'm jumping the gun here a little bit, but can you get or there is there any thought process by these people, these scientists, to get beyond – just baseball into other frontiers? Yeah, I mean, you know, anything that involves a quick decision it can be essentially uh, can be essentially quantified using this neuroimaging technique. I mean, the, ba- the neuroscientists started 
with this idea by studying musicians and the way that they uh, make changes in the co- over the course of a of a of a uh, of a song. They were they were wow. studying cellists at the time. But you can really they have you know you you can use this technology to understand uh, you know it, it, various other sports. Uh, I mean, you think about sports. We often again we we think about the physical nature of these athletes, and we and we um, you know we we are focused generally on on their physical characteristics but their decision making um of let's say a quarterback or or a point guard leading the fast break that's really the the bread and butter for these athletes and so you can uh use this technology to perhaps um get a better understanding of that to this point baseball uh presents a, a little bit of a cleaner uh, opportunity to um to to see that decision making in action it's one interaction it's you know swing or don't swing a dynamic sport like basketball or hockey football it's a little bit more complicated um but i think absolutely it's going to be coming and spreading into uh, various other sports and other disciplines uh whether it's um you know police military um, you know, you can, you name it. I mean, there's really a lot of opportunity here uh, for the ways, that, studying the ways that the, the brain impacts our decisions. Zach, I'd like to uh, have someone study me in determining which caller I go to next because I always seem to be going to the wrong one. So uh, maybe there's one way to incorporate <laughs> that into our show. The, the name of the book is The Performance Cortex How Neuroscience is Redefining Athletic Genius. It, it is just an absolutely fascinating. Uh, conversation. Zach, best wishes to you on the book. I know it's, it's doing incredibly well. It's just out. Uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Be well. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate Thank it. You. Nice talking to you. Welcome back. Glad you're here on a Wednesday afternoon. It's been a good one. Let's go to Taylor in Starkville. Welcome to the show. How are you, Taylor? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Paul? Uh, we are doing great. Thank you for the call. Hey, uh, Ben Baby from A&M was uh, pretty overconfident about them coming down to Starkville this year, weren't they? Uh, I thought so. Yeah, I mean, I mean, he, he yeah, I mean, you, you can't look at Mississippi State through a prism of ten years ago. Uh, it's it's a it's one of the better programs in, in the in the in the conference right now. And for sure, and I think one thing that a lot of people are are forgetting is you know just because Mullen left, I mean, he didn't leave the covered bears as, as far as talent goes. And you know, honestly, even if you ignore the, the all the returning starters on the offensive side and what more that has the potential to do there. People are overlooking the fact that just even on the D line, we're bringing back two first team All SEC guys with the you know All SEC sack leader in Montez Sweat, and so just that D line by itself is going to cause enough havoc to win enough games in the SEC. Yeah, and listen, uh, I think everyone knows what Jimbo has done. That program is not desolate, but it's also pretty much been an eight and four program lately. Uh, and to go on the road to Starkville, I, I don't see that at all. I'm sorry. Yeah, if nothing else, I mean, we won at A&M last year by 21. I have a hard time seeing them coming to our place and turning around a 21-point deficit. Yeah, I'm, I, I totally agree on that. That, that uh, I mean, he was he was matter of fact, but again, we have people on with with uh, distinct opinions, and uh, that's what a call-in show is all about. Oh, for sure. Well, hey, you just did a great job with that last interview. I'll jump <laughs> off and keep listening. But <laughs> thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I think I'm the only one that lost brain cells trying to learn about more intelligence uh kevin is in montgomery alabama how are you kevin i'm great paul how are you we are doing well thank you for the call yes paul i'm calling in today because i'm hearing a lot of these mississippi state and uh here in texas a&m and i'm here in georgia and no georgia the program is on their way back but uh nobody's gonna beat the tide it's just that plain and simple well, uh, you know, the one thing I would offer, and we, we had it from a guest yesterday, he, he said he was concerned about the coordinators, and you can say, well, that's no big deal, but it is a big deal, especially on the offensive side. It's now, what, the third year in a row with a different coordinator? Yes, the coordinators may change, but the talent is still coming year after year. Uh, my offense, tour is going to probably go down and be one of the greatest Well, first of all, Tua's got to win the job, and to win the job, he's got to stay healthy, Kevin. Yeah, I understand that, though, but I don't think that would be a problem. Uh, my problem was last year, uh, I feel like Nick 
Nick really has loyalty in his players, for one. And if you watch the uh, spring game from last year, you can just clearly see Tua outplayed Jalen Hurts last year in the spring game. And his loyalty to Jalen from what he did his freshman year was the reason why he really honestly couldn't just bench Jalen from the beginning. Now, if you watch that Auburn game, I really feel like Nick wanted to put Jalen on the bench in that Auburn game, but he just refused to lose two national championships in a row. He wasn't going to let that happen. Well, it wasn't a very good decision considering uh, they lost the game. You're talking, about, you're, yeah, talking about, you're talking about the Georgia game, not the Auburn game. Yeah, you know, I know he lost the Auburn game right. because I feel like at the halftime he should have pulled Jalen like he did in the Georgia game. Well, I, you know, he probably should have pulled him in the second quarter. But uh, he, he – I mean, I think he made, the, he, made the, he made the decision. He wasn't starting the second half, so he was going to roll the dice, and he did. Yeah, it was a great decision, though, though. Well, you know, you know. Listen, I, I don't. Uh, I agree with you. It, it was a gutsy decision in context, but tell me this, Kevin. You 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 sound like you know a lot about college football. I do. He didn't have a choice. Nah, he really didn't have a choice because it was like, you know, Georgia started putting A in the box, and they was forcing us to run. Although we had great running backs, but. Well, when yeah, you put A in the box, when you put A in the box, I don't really care who you got in the backfield. That's going to be pretty hard to contain. Well, the problem was that you know, he not only had the game to worry about, he had his team to worry about. And, and I, I think you know football as well as anyone else. His team knew a change was necessary. Uh, you could sense they wanted a change. Yes, and uh, like I said, I know we lost a lot on defense, and uh, we lost a whole secondary and. Raquan Davis is going to be a star. So Derrick Lewis is going to be a star as well. Uh, no, you're right. Listen, uh, I mean, Kevin, Alabama continues to have these type of seasons, and I'm not suggesting they won't next year. I think they will. But there is a fine line, and last year it came down to a couple of big plays against Florida State, and Alabama turned that game. And it really came down to a comeback against Mississippi State. That game was – they were on the ropes – in that game, as you well know. Let's grab uh, Brandon. You're on the air. Go right ahead, Brandon. Hey, Paul. How you doing? We are great. Thank you for the call. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you for having me. I was going to say uh, I really enjoyed, really briefly, uh, the guy that you had on there, Zach, with that article about the – Yeah, thank you. It was, uh, what was the book's name again? Good are you, question. Are you there? Uh, the Performance Cortex. I've already forgotten. Okay. The, the performance protect. Okay, I just I really enjoyed that interview. But anyway, Thank you. Um, really quick, I wanted to touch on uh, Alabama's secondary. Um, there's been some times in Alabama's history under Nick Saban where they've had to either replace the front seven or the majority of their offensive line or new you know starting quarterback or this that and the other. Where they you know first year coming in under, the, under this uh, new secondary. Would you possibly label this as one of the tougher situations that Nick Saban's been put in as far as losses, or do you think there's some ones that are worse, first off? Well, you know, first of all, I think he had to overcome a lot last year. Uh, I mean, I mean, but, yeah, I mean, he, 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 has, he has lost uh, an enormous amount. I, I think the let – me, let me go back for a second. I think the issue last year wasn't so much what he started with. It's what he ended up with uh, because of the injuries. But – in terms of transition and turnover, uh, this is an enormous redo, uh, but the talent is, is still pretty significant. There are a couple of spots that the experts aren't as confident about. Welcome back. Glad you're here. One hour to go <laughs> before we uh, say goodnight. Let's get back to the call. We've had a lot of great guests. Kevin is in New Orleans, and you're on the air. Go right ahead, Kevin. Hey, Paul. How are you doing? We are well. Thank you. All right. So... I'm an Aggie, and I'll admit we've had some disappointing years in the past couple of years. But, uh, you know, I got to say, I really think what Jimbo is bringing to the table is going to change the whole demographics of the SEC. I mean, I was watching that spring game, and I don't know, it's kind of hard to describe, but there was something about the toughness and the way the players were going at it. It just looked completely different. Especially considering the fact, you know, we had a tight end that almost had like 200 yards receiving. And, uh, you know, you think about the money, you know, that's one thing, obviously, everyone knows, okay, 
it's hard. You know, you got a family. Who's going to turn down that money? But I think what a lot of people are overlooking is the fact that Jimbo realizes the recruiting potential in the state of Texas. You know, for example, like I hate to bring up the SIPs, but in 2005 when Texas won the national championship against USC, it was like 98, 99% of that roster or something was from the state of Texas. And I think that now that we are the SEC school in the state of Texas, and you look at all the high school talent and the way the programs are run it's from such a young age, I think once Jimbo taps into that, I really think that we're going to take the SEC by storm, especially looking at now. I mean, he closed the class of 18 really quick. I think we just picked up a huge recruit today. We're like at the fifth best class right now. You know, I think it's a matter of time, Paul. I just wanted to hear what you thought about our spring game and yeah, I liked what I saw. Uh, hey, by the way, Kevin, I agree with you. I, I said the other day I thought uh, this is not a dramatic statement, but I, I, I do think he'll get A&M within a reasonable period of time to a playoff because he has experience. That That is a school that has always been on the cusp of greatness. I thought oh, five, yeah. or, five or six years ago, I wrote this in a book about the SEC, that I thought they had the best chance to challenge – Alabama, and it just never materialized because I think Kevin Sumlin in the end mishandled Manziel and never could get his mojo back. Yeah, and, that, and that's the thing that, you know, no one can figure out. I heard Greg McElroy talking about it the other day, um, how for whatever reason, Mac Brown's been the only coach that's been able to tap into the state and really put it right, the right group of guys together at the right time. And you know, exactly what you just said. I think that we, it, we've we been just a step away. You know, we had the Jackie Sherrill days, you know, the R.C. Slocum days. But now when you add the SEC dynamic into it. I agree. And, you know, and, and you know, and like, you know, all credit to Alabama. They've won like 17 national titles. You know, we, sure. we don't have that in our history. But, you know, we do have two Heisman winners. And, you know, we're not, we, we've all, as you said, we've always been close. But, 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 Kevin, I've spent a lot of time on that campus and, Exactly. Yeah, no, I, I just graduated last year, you know, we, and, and, that's right, and that's the other thing. Like, it's, it's building, Paul, I'm telling you. I, it, I, it, I ended up, uh, a couple of years ago, right after the, the SEC, uh, the transfer to the SEC, I was uh, honored to uh, host a uh, a banquet out there. Uh, it was it was sponsored by the former students. You understand what I'm talking about there. That's the, yes, the, the Alumni Association. They honored Gene Stallings. And I spent a day or two uh, really studying that campus. Uh, it was the first time I'd been out there in a while and made a lot of friends and uh, got, got, sat next to the governor at the time, Rick Perry, uh, and became friendly with him. We only talk Aggies. We, we skip politics. And I, I realized at that moment that this school has uh, an alumni base that, that is – second to none. Uh, We know now in terms of the financial support toward that stadium and the facilities are better than anyone else's in the country. Uh, It's in the most fertile recruiting area. And I just think it was it was a mistake after mistake, not big mistakes, but 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 minor mistakes. And, you know, I think uh, give give Scott Woodward and and the chancellor uh, the credit for going after Jimbo and getting Jimbo. I mean, they that's how you do it. You just don't go, oh, we want that guy, and then you decide, well, we can't pay for it. LSU had that problem. Uh, they could have had Jimbo a couple of years ago. They just, uh, they blinked. Uh, they wouldn't pay, they wouldn't pay the freight. Then they, I, I'm not sure they could have had Tom Herman, but, uh, they bailed out of the Tom Herman sweepstakes and ended up with, with that always on. How's that going to work out? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, Paul, it, what we like to say is, the spirit can never be told. You know, that's what we say to students. And, you know, I truly believe it. There, there's no other university like it. It's like what you were talking. There's such a drive and a family feeling. You know, I'll, I'll walk around with my wearing my ring, and I'll have old men come up to me and you know be like, "Hey, introduce themselves to that class of fifty, you know, whatever." And yeah, you know, we just take care of each other, and that's a big aspect. And I think once these players start to see that, now that we got the right man, like at the helm, I just think it's a matter of time. And you know, the one thing I'd say about the the salary for Jimbo too is. What a lot of people forget is that's all donor money. You know, like, I remember the Ohio State, I think it was the Ohio State AD, I'm pretty sure he said, um, he said some snark comment about how, oh, we would never take away money from our, you know, other programs. We Uh, didn't do that. He's full of crap, I'll tell you right now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I I don't like, you know, and that's what I'm, but you know, you look at. But you know something, Kevin, and and I realize it's not my money, but nobody at A&M seems to be concerned. 
it that just like Jackie Sherrill, and you you were way too young, but you've read about. It. I mean, they they brought in Jackie in the early '80s, biggest contract in in history. Sometimes you just have to step up, and uh, and you talk about one of the. I mean, you know better than I do, but I mean, there are not many more wealthier alumni uh, groups than, than than the people out in College Station, and. So what? If it works out, does it really matter that they paid them maybe two two million more than the going rate? Uh, who's that? Who was that going to hurt? Yeah, exactly. Um, well, what did you see the game? What did you think? I mean, I, I must I admit, I, I have really seen. I, I, I oh, watched bits so. and pieces of it, and, and, I, and you're going to hear me say this a thousand times. I I've covered a lot of spring games. I I don't put as much premium on them as many fans do, and I don't want to tell any fan that's going to a spring game this weekend or watching one, don't be excited by it. That's your spring game. But you have to understand what the coach is doing at the spring game. Uh, They're trying to get a result. Uh, They're not concerned about what you think in the stands. They're trying to get what they want to see out of certain players. Uh, So I'm a little cynical about the spring game. Not your game, but spring games in general. Chuck is in California, and you are on the air. Go right ahead. Hey, Paul, thank you so much for taking my call, sir. Sure thank you. It. Hey, Paul, last week you were talking about Bear Bryant movies, and I was curious to know if you happened to see the movie The Bear when it came out in 1983 or 84 and what you thought of it, if you did see it. Yeah, uh, Chuck, I'll go ahead and repeat. Uh, some some people may have heard me say this. I was a newspaper reporter at the time. And, That's what I thought. <laughs> um, my, my assignment was to go to the world premiere and to do my one and only movie review in my career. Mm-hmm. And okay. <laughs> the, I can tell you the headline. I still remember it to this day on the front page of the newspaper in Birmingham. The name of the movie was The Bear. And the headline on my column was The Bear Was a Bomb. And okay. it was so bad that the head of the movie uh, company, uh, the movie chain, called me the next day screaming profanities. Never forget wow. it. And he said, you are forever banned from our movie theaters. I said, great. I'll make out. Yeah. Oh, he, had, he, he did not realize that the movie business was uh, about to become a dinosaur. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, it, uh, it, it was, uh, I might have been a little harsh, but um, I don't think I was. It was just a terrible movie. No. No, it's my understanding that Mary Harmon and the Bryan family did, really didn't care for, no, for it all they, that much. they did either. not. Uh, it was just a yeah. very poor portrayal of a great man. Uh, you know, exactly. I, I was at the uh, the announcement of the movie, and uh, Gary Busey was, was, was chosen to play the lead. Yes, and he was. And Bear Bryant initially wanted John Wayne. Of course, John Wayne died before, before the movie ever uh, came out. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it was just not the right. You know, now, again, Busey played uh, Bear throughout his career, so you couldn't get a 65-year-old exactly. actor to play somebody who was yeah. 35. But, I mean, it wasn't a bad portrayal. The movie was just terrible. Forget Gary Busey. He was, he's a good actor. It was. Yeah, it was. What did you think of Mr. Beringer's performance as the um, a middle-aged bear at um, Texas A&M? I, I really enjoyed the Yeah, no, that, 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 was, that was a junction, boys. Uh, he actually yeah. did a really good job. That was a fantastic portrayal. Well, that's what I thought, Paul. Last summer I took my dream vacation, and that was going to every campus that was part of the old Southwest Conference. And the highlight, you kind of touched upon it with your previous caller, my highlight was going to College Station and walking around campus and enjoying the facilities, Kyle Field, of course, but I'm still impressed at the reverence that these folks still have for the great Paul Bear Bryant in Texas, at Texas A&M. Everyone in the neighborhood knew about Bobby. Bobby, the basketball boy, they called him. Bobby wanted to go pro someday, so he was always out in the driveway shooting hoops. But one day, his mom came out and told him, Hey, your wife wants you to take out the trash? His mom was visiting, and... Bobby was a grown man. He had kind of missed his window. Plus, no one had ever seen him actually make a basket. But on the other hand, Bobby had heard how Geico could save him money on car insurance. So he switched and saved. So it was all good. Welcome back. Uh, Glad you are here. And let's uh, continue. Bill in Valdosta, Georgia, on the phone. And uh, welcome to our program. Hello, Bill. Hey, Paul. It's cool to talk with you again. Thank you. Uh. A little excited. You're talking about the spring games. Uh, what all? Uh, you know how much you can put into them. They are exciting. It's become that. Uh, I guess nowadays the spring game, the recruiting days, the, oh, sure. no, the they signing are, days. They are. They're critically important. I'm just saying. Yes. A- analytically, be careful. Oh yeah, there, you can't. You can't really put anything into them. But it's fun to watch the 
the new guys coming. While we're going to get, you, we'll get to see what field because they all get a chance to play. You get to see the young guys, and, absolutely, and maybe guys that contribute in the future. You get to kind of see what no, like, you've heard well, about well, them. I want, to, I want to amend what I said because sometimes you'll get a fan that that sees a player and then just immediately assumes something. All I'm trying to say is there's nothing wrong with that, but the coaches have a specific strategy going into a game. Uh, they're they're yes. testing player versus player. They're trying to see situations. I mean, they don't get this opportunity very often. They want to see live bullets. Yeah, and that's you'll say that. That's why I think uh, I know. You know, as far as packing the stadium, getting a lot of people, that that has a lot to do with recruiting and letting the recruits see the big crowd. But I think they want to see what these guys can do. They've seen them in practice where you know media gets to watch them for a few minutes, but outside of that, they're not anybody around. See how they react to the big crowds and, and the game day situation. But so it, it, the, the, it is, does set a tone, though. Uh, when Kirby had uh, the ninety thousand or whatever a couple of years ago, that helped let everyone know this program is lifting off. Yes, and it, uh, you know, it. Uh, he's. I think that's part of the recruiting. Maybe where he's taking that next step, where he's. Uh, well, he not, saw. Not he saw how Rick important anyway, that was at, going, at Alabama when when Alabama had ninety three thousand. Uh, Eleven years ago, uh, Nick Saban often said it was it was one of the most significant moments because it said, you know what, uh, we're here. Uh, it, it helped in recruiting more than anything else. Yeah, and let's be honest. You can uh, fans will call in. Each fan, of course, is a diehard to their team, and they see things kind of in their team's best view. But Kirby's brought that where now. That Alabama blueprint that everybody talks about is true. It's the talent. It's who you get into your program, how deep that talent base is year and year replacing guys. That you, There's a lot of great coaches, but you've got to have that base of talent. And really I think the confidence of a lot of Georgia fans now is that they see that talent base starting to evolve and where it's year after year there's guys that can step in, you know, and, it, it, it recruiting's huge, and I think Kirby came with a lot of that from Nick. What <laughs> what you what players like to see, what players want to be a part of, and he's selling that. And it's it's it, he's taking what Mark Rick did, a great recruiter, to another level, and that's he really it's benefiting is. Georgia you're, now you're for sure. One hundred percent correct. Thanks for the call. Rick is also in Georgia. Okay. Hello, uh, go right ahead. Hey, Paul, how you doing? First time caller. Thank you. Long time listener. Glad to hear from you. Hey, uh, I just wanted to ask you about the defense. Do you think Georgia's going to have the same production that we had last year out of our defense? I think they'll be good, but but Rick, tell me this uh, losing Carter, losing <laughs> Raquan. I mean, I, I don't know how it can be quite to that level. I know, I know the five stars are rolling in. Uh, uh, at a record number, but still, from an experience standpoint, they will not have that. Uh, no, you cannot replace Roquan Smith. You can't replace the senior leadership that we had last year. But I, I don't think it's going to fall off the face of the earth either, Rick. Uh, appreciate the call very much. Uh, Jim is up next. Not that Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Paul. Happy Wednesday, man. Great to hear from you. Thank you. All right, Paul, I was sitting there drinking a cold one, looking out the front door, watching your program. How beautiful Mother Nature is turning everything about a million different colors of green. I had a revelation. I like to hear that. Paul, have you seen the the machine advertised on TV called the the Vage, where you fill it up with saline solution and you put it up to your nose and it flushes out your sinuses? Oh, I have heard about that, yes. I like that idea. All right, I figured out that Matt and Daryl, their ma- ma- uh, machines backfired and blew their brains out of their ass. <laughs> and uh, I, man, what kind of this this uh, title he's given himself? He's some kind of a in, uh, indoor or air comfort he's engineer an indoor or whatever it is. Air. He is an indoor. Comfort, indoor outdoor comfort engineer. Uh, I figured out what that means, Paul. He knows how to open and shut a window. <laughs> I think you're right. Yeah, yeah, that's what that means. Paul, I'll let you go and uh, uh, pray for everybody and have a good day. Thank you very much. Uh, you brought a little bit of levity to the program, Hunter. 
is in Florida. You're on the air. Go right ahead, Hunter. Hunter, are you there? I always hate that when you can't uh, hear the call. We'll give more. I don't. I don't think we're going to get them. What can I say? Brams, we couldn't hear Hunter. He's probably out hunting something right now. Makes sense. So we got the name Hunter. Um, I do hate that. I'm with you. I'm he waited figure, and he had his chance. I'm and trying to figure something out. And I want to go back to what I, I think is the line of the day. And for those who missed it, I want, I want to make sure I read this correctly. We had, a, we had a typical gym call, as you know. And then, Bram, we had... A call from Phyllis. We had not heard from Phyllis right. in months. She came out of retirement almost. And she was unhappy with the way Jim was treating us here right. on the show. And she said, and I quote, I, she's in a wheelchair right now. She said, I will roll my wheelchair up there where you are and beat you with my oxygen tank. That's one of the great, that's one of the great lines I think I've heard on this show in a yeah. long time. Yeah, it's it it floored all of us here in the control room. We you know we were we were just kind of jaws dropped. Uh, we posted on the Facebook page. It's already doing crazy numbers. People, all kinds of people from the fine mom community are shouting out Phyllis uh, on social media. It's great. 